Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the October 23rd meeting of the Charles County Board of Education. Can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first thing on the agenda is a presentation on student transfer. Dr. Jones and company. here that the policy and the rule are, are pretty extensive as you, as you review it. So policy 5126 and then rule 5126 and 5126.1 and 5126.2, uh, pretty extensive. And so I'll give you the, the, the highlights today, uh, the things I think that the, you and the public will be most interested in just sort of hearing and, and re-familiarizing yourselves with regarding uh, the policy. And so um, here the um, Board of Education, Charles County shall require students to attend a school which they are assigned. Um, and then uh, if a student or family would like to request um, transfer to another school, that again is not in the one in which the student resides, um, then they do have to uh, meet certain qualifications or conditions of policy 5126, so of course rule 5126 uh, and or both. Um, underneath uh, some statements here that can be found in the rule as well that we thought would make sense to point out today, be important to point out. The student zone <coughs> school is based with the student's domicile. So you may have heard me use the word reside. So we do sort of take that word, uh, we sort of move uh, the word reside to domicile, change that to domicile for the parent and then for definition of what domicile is. Um, we have defined it as an individual soul, permanent home, without present intention of change and notwithstanding the existence of homes or residences elsewhere. And then for the sake of the rest of this presentation, uh, the last part is what we're going to talk about. Custodial parent guardians, a parent or guardians may request to transfer the child to a school um, other than the one to which they are assigned to according to the rule if there is a reason the parent wants to uh, ask for a change of schools. So, can, can do that. so the process for when parents have reached this decision. Um, parents and guardians must complete a school change of request form and submit it to the um, Office of uh, Student Services. Um, and students must, um, until a decision is made, students must remain in their, zo their zone school, their assigned school. Um, a decision for this request can take up to uh, 10 work days. Um, the decision letters are mailed out and sent by email. Decisions are, um, if uh, a parent is not in agreement with a decision that has been rendered from the Office of Student Services, the parents may appeal that decision. And, uh, and that decision, that appeal would come to um, the Office of School Administration and Leadership. And so, the appeal process, and that's not stated here, but the appeal process is outlined in the letter. So the letter that, uh, the decision letter that parents would get from the 
Office of Student Services would tell them exactly how to appeal their decision if they were not pleased with it. And so when the appeals do, if you don't mind going back one quick, Mr. Lowndes, when the appeals do come to my office, uh, well, if um, the Office of School Administration upholds the Student Services decision, heard my voice change a little bit. <laughs> Backing away from the microphone. Or? <laughs> All right. So, um, so when those appeals are made to to our office, um, if we. Uh, uphold student services decision so this uh, obviously this means that student services denied their request and so when they appeal to our office if we uphold their denial then the parents do have the opportunity to appeal to your level to the board level so it would leave from my office to you if parents wanted to uh, go to the next step if they were not pleased with the decision they received out of out of our office and so uh, when considering these um, decisions the, the appeals um, these are some of um, the, the things that, that, that may be considered if we were really, um, you know, considering families' um, appeals. And so uh, these, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are, uh, are the, the big ones. Again, the, the rule itself can be researched and you can find more details there, but some that we thought uh, are, are the more popular ones, if you will, to highlight here today. Uh, domicile changes after the start of the second semester to finish the school year. So these are reasons that we would consider approving such um, an appeal that came our way. Uh, domicile changes during the student's senior year to remain at that, at that school that they are enrolled in. Um, if, for example, a senior's family moves and they move out of the zone, um, they are a senior, we, we tend to consider those favorably, um, thinking about the senior who is about to graduate. Um, parents or guardians have entered into a contract to purchase a home before the end of the first quarter. So this is our prospective home buyers clause that you can read about in there. Um, ten, we typically give uh, favorable consideration if there is such a document there that we receive an academic course of study that is not offered within the student zoned school. Um, reason that we do consider H uh, unusual hardships. Uh, which are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that's probably the one that we, we receive the, the most uh, appeals. Um, and sometimes families are not pleased with the responses received because that, again, considered on a case-by-case -case basis, there are no, no guarantees. And, um, and while the hardship cases we review, um, we acknowledge that they are leg legitimately hardship cases for those particular families. Um, but we do look at them in the grand scheme of things. There are times where um, they may not be as, as, as um, I don't want to say hard, but they may not be as uncommon um, as what people may think. Um, daycare issues, uh, for example. Um, parent or guardian is a full-time CCPS employee. Uh, the request, uh, the requested school must be in the zone of the, of the employee's work location. So um, our employees who work for us, the school that they would like their child to attend, it must be within the zone of the place that they, the school that they, they work, for example. Um, and then for in-county employees, there, there is no tuition that we charge. For out-of-county employees, there is a reduced tuition, um, and which may be waived if that employee was brought on before uh, January the 1st, 2013. And uh, an approved child of, child, child of a CCPS employee is eligible for athletics and extracurricular activities immediately. Um, if it is a non-CCPS employee's child, um, if they are approved, um, they are not eligible for one calendar year from the date of enrollment. So just some of the um, guidelines there that we consider um, approving appeals. Um, some of the conditions, uh, we thought we'd point some of these out. Uh, the receiving school, and so just, you know, some of the conditions and then just a, a footnote under each here. The receiving school, if um, the student is approved, the school must have enrollment space. Um, enrollment should not negatively uh, affect 
any great specific grade or program of studies if we will if we are going to approve it um, as far as the academic course of studies I may be approved if the course of study is not offered within that um, zone school but that does not include um, JROTC and world languages and other courses offered at each school with a different academic focus so everyone knows that we do have for example JROTC at each of our schools but it's a different military branch um, but it is offered at each school um, hardships again are, are considered on a case-by-case -case basis um, exceptions and I think I mentioned this a moment ago exceptions are not granted uh, for common circumstances affected many students such as sibling enrollment or redistricting um, or uh, daycare issues <coughs> and then lastly uh, transportation um, the last condition that we noted here for um, consideration if uh, the student is approved if the appeal is approved um, the student is not eligible for transportation um, parents do have to transport their own children to uh, to and from school and uh, and when they receive their decision letter that gives them the um, approval conditions all of this is, is spelled out um, that that you know the transportation is not available that you do have to transport your child to and from school um, and and so on um, the enrollment space if there's a denial from the student services office it will tell the family that you know the reason for the denial um, sometimes it is oftentimes it is because of enrollment um, you know the space at our schools um, the space at our schools is um, uh, absolutely for the school students who live in that zone and many of our schools are over the state rate capacity so sometimes that comes into play um, we will get the question sometimes uh, from families well what you know if you're telling me that it's over enrolled what if I moved into that zone well if you moved into that zone then you have a right to attend that school uh, so that just is what it is if you don't live in that zone then we certainly are going to take a look at um, whether or not we're going to approve that when the schools are already um, overcrowded so to speak um, over the state rate of capacity um, and then uh, that, oh, yes I'm sorry so then there is when uh, an approval is given there is a right to rescind so the superintendent or designee um, and the designee is typically the school principal has the right to rescind a transfer um, for several reasons but not limited to this list that's always noted in the letters that parents receive uh, behavioral concerns attendance issues um, academic performance and then fraud um, including fraudulent document or proof of domicile uh, believe it or not we actually have that sometimes um, where families are, are uh, um, they, they're really wanting their student to be in a particular school and so sometimes you know folks will go the lengths of making things seem as though they're not they are not and so um, so these are, are, are things that um, principals do have the right to rescind that offer um, but I will say that when students are uh, approved we ask our principals we advise our principals to work with students and we don't expect students to be perfect um, you know whether they are, are attending school out of zone or not so the slightest behavior issue that comes up doesn't mean that principal is going to put them out and send them to their home school um, chronic kinds of you know um, um, I guess uh, more severe kinds of behavior concerns could be a reason that a principal does say um, that this is this is not working out the way we had planned and so you have to go back to your home school um, attendance issues again um, things that that we're looking at, at as being chronic kinds of situations work with families as you normally would is what we tell principals um, but certainly look at that um, if that's an issue then clearly the family's having troubles getting them to and from school which was one of the conditions that they were approved on and so um, so just again a couple of the things there that a couple of the reasons that principals would have to um, uh, rescind an approval if it came down to it and I think in the last, I think this is the last slide here. Um, we just wanted you to, to have an idea of what some of the numbers look like um, as we went back and took the last few years as far as the number of requests that are received, school trace requests that are received. So in 20, uh, 2020, 21, the first year up there, there were 344 requests received that year. Uh, 223 of them were approved. 121 of them were denied. And of those denials, uh, 42 of them were appealed. And of those appeals, 
that came to our office, 25 of them, our office upheld uh, the decision that student services made, and then 17 of them uh, we overturned. And, um, and as we look at them, I'll just tell you in our office, we have a team of us that looks at each appeal that comes in. And we look very carefully at all of the documentation that was provided from the very beginning of the process when they first uh, submitted a student, a school change request form uh, up through when we got the paperwork and everything that's in between. And so uh, we, we look at it very carefully, each one of them very carefully and try to make decisions that are uh, that we believe are, are, are fair and uh, the best. And so uh, 21, 22, there were 372 requests received, 187 of them were approved, um, 185 were denied, 64 were appealed, of those, 64 of those denials were appealed, 37 of those appeals were upheld, and then 27 were overturned, and you can see the other years in 22, 23. So last year we had 403 that were received, and then uh, this year so far up through October 10th, we had 288 requests that were received. So the request that we receive every year, um, it's not necessarily a, a calendar year because what happens is um, folks do begin in late spring applying for, sometimes um, applying to go to school out of zone mm -hmm. for the following year. Sometimes it's for that year they're in. Sometimes it's for the following year. And so, so, so late spring, we'll, we'll get an uptick in the number of them that we receive, uh, but in the end, uh, we do receive them all throughout the year um, for various reasons. So, you know, sometimes people move and they don't tell us and we find out about it later and then we have to send them a letter say, okay, we know you're not living there anymore. You have to go to where you, school you live. And then uh, they'll put in a request. Um, other times, um, they, uh, you know, families have had a problem at the school that, that their child is attending or, or multiple problems, it could be related to some sort of uh, behavior or bullying type of things. There are all kinds of reasons that people ask to go to a school outside of their zone. Uh, but nonetheless, the numbers have um, kind of crept up, as you can see, the last few years, um, 344, 372, 403, and right now we're at 288. And so um, so, so, so they're just going up, and, and we take them when they come. They always go through student services first, and then when they are appealed, they come to uh, our office. Um, and then the last just footnote there, um, there have been up to this point since 2021, um, more than 1,400 forms have been received in process. And so, so it keeps us a little busy um, in, you know, it's one of the things that keeps us busy uh, in the student services office. And then certainly um, when families are not um, happy with the response they've gotten, um, they'll come to our office and we, we try to help resolve the issue. And I think that might be, yes, yeah, so. Thank you very uh, much, Dr. Yes, Jones. Indeed. Thank you. Any questions, comments from board members? Yeah, Ms. Kramer. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Just one quick question. Do we have any data on um, like the most common reasons that um, requests, transfer requests are submitted, like maybe a top three or something like that? Yeah, I, I'm sure we could capture that data uh, I should uh, I mean we have all the records too uh, I don't I, I, as far as in my office um, we don't keep it separately uh, in the student services office I'm not 100% sure if they keep it separately but again they have all that documentation because they send us, us copies of it so we certainly could find that out um, what would be the, the top reasons um, Hard for me to say because, as you can see, a lot of them come to us, but not all of them. A lot of them just get processed there in uh, student services. Right. So um, I could tell you, and, you know, the ones in in our office, um, probably the highest the highest number of the ones that we receive are where families have had some concern, some 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 problem, um, and then behind behind that is probably where they have moved and they. Um, they didn't inform us that they had moved and then we found out, you know, by mail coming back or however the reason we found out that they had moved and so we, um, we had to tell them that the child can't go there. So then uh, unless you put in a school change request and have us, you know, consider it and so then that happens. And so, um, but yeah, so that data, I don't have hard numbers, but if that's something that you'd be interested in us finding out, we certainly could. I just um, feel like it might be helpful, um, particularly if we're going to be looking at the process. Um, you know, I think it, it might be helpful to us to know, um, you know, what, what the majority of the requests are based on. So maybe we can look at how we can um, just ha just how to look at that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think. I mean, 
never serves me, and again, this I know you don't get it at your level. I think the last time we looked at this, I think most of the requests actually came from um, employees of the system um, because they have that that right under the the yeah. negotiated contract to have their child go to the school where they work there but but they still have to go through this process but if you could get us that 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 would be good miss yeah, smith and then sure, miss morley uh thank you dr jones for the presentation yes, i right. think of the probably top five reasons that you know parents and families typically reach out to me the transfer policy is definitely within the top three. Mm -hmm. um, so taking a moment to kind of walk through what is the kind of decision process for the public is very important. Just wanted to say thank you. Just wanting to ensure that the public knows that for students who are part of the McKinney-Vento program, so homeless, neglected, and delinquent, um, those facing housing insecurity, they are not a part of this process. That, they are that, allowed to remain in their home school. They, they are permitted to remain in their home schools, um, but we do ask them to fill out this paperwork and there is um, our person who oversees McKinney Vento, Bethany Goodwin. Um, she is a coordinator over, I hate to mess up her title, but um, <laughs> maybe students in certain programs or whatever it might be. Um, but she's a person that we consult with when it comes to students uh, with McKinney Vento because, yes, you're right, those students are, um, uh, uh, we, we treat them differently when, in that regard to be sure that we're doing right by them. But Absolutely. it does mean that um, these rules don't necessarily apply exactly as they do to everyone else. Appreciate it. Yes. And I do support uh, my colleague, Ms. Kramer, and Chairman Lucas in sort of looking at trend data sure. um, just to get a sense of are we truly doing right by the majority of the community and the, with the policy we presently have? Okay. Or are there some additional considerations that the board should make in a future iteration of that policy? So would appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Morley? Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned, this was very helpful. A couple of questions. Um, one, what typically happens after the, the transfer process? And my understanding is it's for that academic year, right? So what happens after that year? Is Great that? question. Yeah, so, so at the end of that year, the um, decision is reviewed. And so, um, and if there are no concerns regarding that student remaining in that building, mm -hmm. then that student will remain in that building until they matriculate to the next level. So, so they don't have to reapply necessarily? They don't have to reapply. So there, there, there was a time, I think, when we might have had that in place or that might have been a practice of ours. Um, but I think by, by rule, they don't have to reapply, but it is reviewed okay. um, at the end of the year to determine. And so that's consulting with the, with the administration and all of that. Um, and they take into account enrollment and behavior yes. and all the, okay. Yes. Thank um, you. Um, and when you mentioned about appeals being overturned, were you talking about at your level, when you, the, the aggregate number, yes. or is it including board level appeals? So no, so I think, um, go back a couple of slides if you don't mind, Dan, for some hours. Um, uh, no, go, I'm sorry, uh, the last, right there. Yeah. Um, so no, so those ones that are um, overturned, so they were overturned in, in our mm -hmm. office. Okay. But if you look under, I did put one set here under 22, 23, bottom left. Okay. Um, so 53 were right. appeals were upheld. So they were upheld in my office. We okay. upheld student services decision. Okay. And then um, two of them, because they didn't, they didn't, didn't like my decision. They appealed them to the board level, right? And then, um, but uh, 12 of the appeals were overturned. So I did not put what your decision was though of those two. Okay. So I didn't include that. Okay. Um, but two of them did leave from my level to your level. Okay. But all the rest of them um, are just at, at my office's level. They okay. were, yes, up to you old. And to piggyback a little bit on Ms. Kramer's question, and the answer is probably no, and not to put you on the spot, but I'm just curious if there's uh, data, if there could be, on how students do after the transfer. You know, does it, you know, especially those that maybe, to your point, because of bullying or behavioral issues, if there is any change once they're at, at the new school or, you know, if, if there remain concerns after. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know that we have um, tracked that data per se. I mean, I'd have, I'd have to ask some of my team because some of my folks may know better than I. Um, I'm not sure because there, again, there's so many different reasons that we, right. you know, do allow transfers, and not all of them are related to something that went wrong. You know, right. um, and so um, that's a fair point. So, so I'm not sure, but okay. uh, I can ask. Let's and one, if, oh, can I just add sure. um, that. If it was a behavioral issue, I think Dr. Jones mentioned that there's a way in which the permission to go to another school may be rescinded. 
yeah. because That's, we've had some cases true. where because of behavior issues um, we have rescinded some requests for changes but um, you know and then and then the yearly reviews of continuing within that great cluster of the school is mm -hmm. something that I think gets done at a more school level administrator and mm -hmm. um, right. your executive directors to continue through. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. And one last question, do you happen to know if, if there's a particular level where most of these occur? Is it elementary that you're seeing like the bulk of them or most of them high school? Or is it pretty fairly scattered as far as you know? Just curious. It's, it is kind of scattered. I, okay. I'd say a lot of them are elementary. Okay. The ones at the uh, high school level, sometimes are related to athletics so sometimes that comes into play okay. um but uh but yeah i don't know i'd have to look at the data we okay. see them across the board there's so many that we get i, I there's sometimes a, yeah. i'm reading the you yeah. know the, the remarks there and, and yeah. barely paying attention to, to the grades <laughs> and all of that but um but yeah. certainly that's recent, that's data we could easily oh, um, i appreciate you know, that sir. And just yeah, you know sure. just thinking about that as we consider the policy mm -hmm. going forward all right thank you dr johnson thank you okay. miss brother washington Yes, thank you for the data. Um, and I agree with uh, Board Member Kramer and the rest of my colleagues about the data. Um, I wanted us to really look at the um, when a uh, parent have one uh, student that um, has been bullied in the school, in the same school, uh, and you allow that child to leave, but the other sibling is sitting there. And just taking consideration that parent who you know was having that issue at that school and now in the back of their head they're worrying about the other child that's you know kind of stressful so i want us to look at this process as if um if we allow one child to move and both of those children are in the same school um that it could be a possibility for that parent also to have for uh, under their distress because they could say no i don't want my second child to move because they're doing excellent but you know just given that uh self-confidence with that uh parent to say you know you can actually move with your other syllabus syllabus sibling, sibling. sibling. Yeah. <laughs> i could get it out there for a minute yeah. but um th that could be something possible because um as looking back as a parent if i'm my one of my kids are going through bullying and then the thought of my second child could go through it and I have to wait through this whole process again to even see if you're going to let them go. It would, it's just a lot of stress on a parent. You mean siblings in the same school the at same the same school. time? Yes. Yeah. So, so we absolutely, we, you know, we consider all of that. I can tell you that um, off the top of my head, we rarely have a situation where a parent is asking for one child to move and not asking for their sibling. Typically, when we get an appeal, they'll be asking for all of their children because they don't necessarily want them to be in different schools either, regardless of if just one of them had a problem or not. Typically, they'll ask for, for both, and then sometimes the reason for the second one will be because I want them both to be together because the first one, we had an issue. It's, it's rare that we, ask, we have siblings where the parent doesn't ask for them both. Um, but uh, we consider everything that they su families submit. We submit, we, we consider it, read it thoroughly, very carefully. Do we do a lot of research and uh, before making a decision, um, you know, on everything we get for every child. But but it's a rare occasion that, that we get one. Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but but I think it would be really rare if we get one where there's a sibling in that school and the family's not at. Typically, I mean, we'll get lots of them with where we're three or four different ones and, and they are all siblings in that building. And we consider every single one of them. Um, but rarely did we get one where there's a sibling in that building okay. that they didn't ask for. Yeah. All right, Ms. Morin. Hi, thank you for that presentation. I have about three questions um, relating to bullying. Um, is there a tiered approach to how you decide if a student should be transferred because they've been bullied? And what does that, you don't have to get into the weeds of what it looks like, but how do you just determine, um, you know, sure. that bullying That's behavior is something that, you know, they need to be transferred for? Uh, absolutely. Um, so um, it, it is something that when it does happen, what we look for is that it's documented um, as actual bullying at the school. And so that entails the, the family having completed the bullying, harassment, intimidation uh, paperwork at the school and allowed the 
uh, administration there, the opportunity to follow that process to identifying it and addressing it, um, which does involve at least a six-week period where, you know, they do initial investigation and then whatever they decide decisions they're going to make every two weeks they have to check back in. And then if things are going well, fine. If things are not, they have to address it. And so there's a whole bullying, you know, um, process that's followed by the administration. Um, but for us, when it comes down to that being a reason that, that parents have asked for their child to go to a different school or appealed it to our level, we do look to see just um, what that looked like. Um, sometimes we will hear families tell us that my child was bullied, um, but we have no documentation that that was ever reported to the school. Um, and so we, we look for that, um, whether it's formal or informal, I mean, we, we really need the formal. So mm -hmm. do the paperwork, having let the school, giving the school an opportunity to address it. Um, but but we, we, we read it and we research it either way. Um, but that's, the, that's really the thing that we look for to determine whether or not when it is bullying, uh, we'll do some research then to see what efforts have been put into place to uh, help help stop that at the school um, and whether or not they have been effective or not. Um, so that all plays into the decision that, 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 that we make regarding removing a student um, based on, on bullying. You know, is it something, you know, removing sometimes a student is disruptive. And so if we can help it, um, we want students to be in the school where they, they're zoned for, they're typically that's their, their neighborhood peers and all of that. I mean, we think that's best in most cases, but in some instances it's not, you know. But so we want to exhaust our efforts to at least find out the best information, um, uh, particularly when it comes to moving a student related to bullying. Okay. A lot of my colleagues talked about the data. So are there any instances where you have data for the pills that are not, that, well, that are um, upheld? Say, for instance, a bullying, you, you deemed it not transferable. Do you have any data um, to reflect the, the pills that were upheld at all? Like the result, like after, it's like, no, you can't be transferred. Would that be reflected? Yeah. That's just with well, bullying. Would it be reflected in like suspension data or, you um, know what I mean, like the outcome? I, I, I got you. So, so what I can say is that um, when we... Um, d deny or uphold an, a decision that the student services made, uh, we are very aware when um, something else comes up with that child. So, okay. so our office is, works really closely with the principals. Okay. And so um, what will happen sometimes is families will apply for a school change request again. So they'll go through it, it'll get denied or what have you, and then maybe some time will come, go by and then something else will occur and it'll come up again. They'll apply for it again. Okay. And we can look at that again and say, we got a, a bit of a trend, a bit of a, a pattern here. So is there something to that? Is there a little more to, to, to what we, you know, is there something we missed the last time around or what have you? We, we'll, we'll dig deeper into it if we receive repeat um, requests. Um, but but the, but the principals keep us in in the loop on because you know they get all the same documentation that we get when we, you know, let them know that this person is approved or not approved or what have you. So they they are very aware of who these students are, and so they keep us informed on, on what's going on with those students. Um, we've heard success stories where we kept students there because, in our letter when we send it to families, we give them typically some guidance on what things can be put into place on how they can help resolve some of the concerns that they've had. Um, meeting with the counselor, meeting with the grade level administrator, um, you know, getting with a peer mediation group or a mentor. I mean, we, we will spell these things out. Sometimes it's um, working with the aftercare programs in the neighborhood. So we'll give them a link to, uh, give families a link to, to connect with aftercare, aftercare programs or what have you. Um, so, so many different, depending on what the issue is, many different things will we give as um, suggestions to help, you know, this mat things go smoothly if we're going to deny the request and, and um, or uphold, I guess, the decision and send them back to the home school. The, 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 the home school. Yeah, we, we'll try to set them up for success um, okay. when they return. Awesome. My last question, um, as far as it relates to students with special needs transferring, someone reached, a parent reached out to me about, um, well, her, actually her kid was, transitioning from elementary school to middle school. Mm -hmm. And I guess her home middle school didn't have the services that was needed, I guess, for and maybe a certain di different programs yeah. at different schools. So I know that's kind of different when the, cat, the kid is actually just leaving elementary, going to middle. But has there been any instances where um, parents with students with special needs needed to transfer and what's the process with that? Yeah, so 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 they follow the same process as far as the paperwork goes, okay. um, but with, the services that they 
you know, share with us that their child um, has or needs. And, and we will review the paperwork, the IEP um, as well, um, to determine if, because what we hear from families is what you said, is that the school that they're going to doesn't have the, the services or isn't able to provide the services that my child needs. Mm -hmm. So we do some research on that. Sometimes it turns out that families may not be as in the know, that the, what their child needs really is there and does exist. And so sometimes it's just a matter of connecting people to really kind of find out that, um, that your child's needs can be met in uh, the home school, the, the school that they're supposed to go to. Um, and, and in some cases, we, we look very carefully at those. And if we think differently than what perhaps the IEP team thought or the school team thought, then we will you know, do some in-house kind of consulting with each other. Because sometimes it's a decision that should be made outside of us. Maybe it's the IEP team or committee that meets along with the central office folks that has a discussion. And maybe there's some decisions there that should be made outside of the school change request process. Um, but students with special needs are looked at you know, very closely to ensure that if whatever decision we're going to make, the students' needs can be met um, in the school that they're, they're going to be going to. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I just have a quick question. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit uh, answering Ms. Warren's question. Um, one question that I have gotten a few times on this topic uh, from citizens is usually around daycare. Um, and it's uh, predominant in areas of the county where there's a lot of elementary schools and those elementary school boundaries are very close mm -hmm. um, to where uh, daycare providers may be pretty close to that family, but they're, they happen to be in another school district. Yeah. Um, and I think I heard you um, when you were answering Ms. Warren's question about trying to help uh, instead of just denying, which I guess for one, would you give consideration uh, for for daycare? Uh, and if not, well, could you ex explain yeah. again the steps? That sure. We yeah. So so daycare is one of the ones that's, that's specifically mentioned in the rule that we don't give consideration for as far as a reason to allow a, a school change. Um, but like I was saying, we 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 try very hard not to just you know say no. We, we try to give some, some options that can help families um, resolve their issues. So, so we you know, look up different daycares in the areas and we'll provide phone numbers, we'll provide email links. You know, we'll do what we can to, to you know, push people in the right direction. Um, of course, Alphabet at the elementary schools is something that we always plug. Um, but, but we try very hard when we know we're given an answer that families are not you know, wanting to be sure that we, you know, again, set them up for success and, you know, by pointing them in the right direction as much as what we can. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Thank you. Yes, Ready wasn't enough for you. More things to look at. Yeah. Chairperson Lucas, how are you today? Good. Vice Chair Morley, good to see you. Board members, Superintendent, Dr. Navarro. Today we're here to talk about how well we did on our state assessments and to talk about our summer programming, what we offered, and whether it was successful or not. And before we, uh, I turn it over, and I have uh, helping me tonight, uh, Mr. Roberts, he's Director of Accountability, Ms. Megan uh, Hungerford, Director of Elementary Education, and Ms. Melissa Mythewicz, Director of Secondary Education. Uh, at the end, we will discuss what we're doing to improve upon our scores, both in the, the state scores, but also when you look at how well we, our students are doing now in the iReadies after uh, the summer learning. Uh, we have some work to do and we recognize that and we acknowledge that. You will see we're making growth um, in our areas. And I just want to remind you before Mr. Roberts goes over our state assessments, that the state's, uh, state assessments is kind of an endpoint and it lets us know where our students are and whether they are on uh, grade level standard at the end of the year. And I think when we showed you the iReady data during the year last year, what you saw is we have quite a few students that are actually are not at grade level, um, and, but they are improving. Um, and they are either from two, two or three grade levels behind up to 
one grade level behind, but they're still behind. And so all of that work that our schools are doing to catch students up is not always reflected in the state assessments. Uh, but we are making progress. And I just want to remind folks that, you know, after COVID, we were in a big hole where many of our students were two or three grade levels behind. And it's going to take us some time to catch up. But we are making progress and we'll continue to make progress. And I just want to remind folks before uh, Mr. Roberts goes ahead and shows how well we did on this year, this past year's state data, and we did improve on the year before. So Mr. Roberts. Okay, so to, to begin, uh, this, is gonna, this is the first slide that's going to show English language arts comparing the spring 2022 school year to the, the most recent spring 2023 results. So this chart's broken in for each different grade level, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, so on and so forth, all the way up to the 10th grade level. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act requires states to administer to assess students in both math and English language arts in grades three through eight and at least once through high, once in high school for each of those subjects. So um, this is the MCAP assessment that was first administered for the 21-22 school year, which is the first chart on the left, first bars on the left of each of those grade levels, and then also administered in the 22-23 school year, which was just this past year. Previously, we administered the park administration, um, and that last time that was administered was the 1819 school year. So, um, when you look at this, each of the students are are, are going to fall into one of four categories. They're going to be either level one, two, three, or four, which is level one and two, one is beginning learners, level two is developing learners, level three is proficient learners and level four is distinguished learners. In order to be considered proficient, a student has to be, earn either a three or a four on the assessment. So the, the orange bars across here are students that are proficient learners who, what percentage of students in each of those years were proficient learners or, or earned a score of three or four on the assessment. And then the students in blue, the percentages in the blue are the students who were uh, not proficient, which were the beginning learners and developing learners. So you can see in, across in each of these different grade levels that where we were from the 21-22 school year in comparison to 22-23 school year. So you can see across that we've had gains in five of the different grade levels from where we were in terms of the orange, the percent of students who were proficient. So we've, we've, made, some, we've made some gains in proficiency. So again, this is English language arts. All right, so then what we also do, have done here is gone by grade level. Uh, we're missing a slide here. Okay, here we go. All right, here's the mathematics one. So this is grades third grade through uh, eighth grade. Very similar setup, same, same scoring for proficiency levels. So showing gains from where we were in 22 versus where we were in the spring of 23. So again, we're seeing gains, proficiency level gains in five of our grade levels across, across schools. So um, you'll see that in the eighth grade math, there is a 5% and 95% with an asterisk. Um, anytime there is a percentage that is less than 5% or more than 95%, the state requires us to suppress that data. So it's suppressed at the state level and all the way across. So um, when we see that eight, Algebra 1 score here, this is Algebra 1 for any students that actually took it at the middle school level or at the high school level. So that 14.1% are students that took Algebra 1 in 2023, whether they took it while they were in middle school or they were at the high school level. The Algebra 2 scores, for the most part, are students that, uh, remember that when I had said in the, the ESSA requirement was that we had to test students in math and in English language arts at least once in high school. So uh, most of those students in the Algebra 2 category are students that took Algebra 1 at the eighth grade level and needed a high school mathematics assessment in order to to meet the federal standards. So that number is the number of students, or the percentage of students that passed it, or were proficient at the Algebra 2 level. 
Okay, then what we've also done is, here we go, is we've done a breakdown for each school. Now what this is, this is the elementary level and something new that the state provided for us this year was a combination of all grades three through third through fifth. So we've put all of those grades together in terms of English language arts proficiency level for each different school. So we didn't have that for previous years. It's a new um, category that they have for us. So we're able to show where the first bar there is CCPS grades three through fifth and then each of the different elementary schools. And then similarly, at the middle school level, we are able to show sixth through eighth grade for CCPS, and then each of, the, each of the middle schools and what their percentage was for each of the different categories, proficient or not proficient. And at the high school level, the English language arts test that's administered is the English 10 assessment so the first bar is ccps grade 10 and then each of the different high schools and their percentages and similarly for mathematics again elementary level third through fifth combined and then each of the different elementary schools now for mathematics this middle school grade six through eight includes all, all math grades six through eight, which also includes the Algebra One students. But we also separated those out, so you'll see the Algebra One students as a breakdown for just the middle schools and at the high school level, so you can see the difference between those groups as well. So this slide includes all, all, all math at the middle school level, including Algebra One. This is specifically the students who took Algebra One, whether they took it in seventh grade or eighth grade, and how they, how they performed. And that's the CCPS Algebra One Middle School, first one. What percentage, just for information, of the students took Algebra One in middle school versus what percentage <coughs> took it in high school? Uh, roughly 30, 30, 36, 35% of students at middle school level roughly 65% at the high school level. So then what you could see here is at the high school level, again, using those data suppression rules, we have um, each of our high schools and the average at the high school level for CCPS is 5% proficient or less than 5% proficient and then, or more than 95% not proficient at the high school level. We have some work to do there. So as you can see, we do have some work to do, and we're going to talk a little bit at the end of this uh, session about the summer boost, about the work that we're doing to keep moving our students forward. So I want to um, talk a little bit about the summer boost program. So the Summer Boost program is really looking at students that need extra help and extra support with reading and math. Uh, it's focused on those two areas, but based on some data that we collected from previous summers from families and from students, uh, we've added some other uh, SEL work going on um, in, in buildings and we, we provided that. And we also added some of our elective courses and we had some elective teachers go out and work with our students uh, to break up the day and only, not only have them just focus in on math and reading, even though that was a primary purpose, but also give the students a little time during the day to do other things. So at this time, I'm going to have Ms. Hungerford talk a little bit about what the Summer Boost Elementary Day looks like, and then Ms. Meisowitz will talk about the secondary summer boost. Okay, good, good afternoon. So um, it says that students were identified using fall and spring iReady. We also used winter, I apologize for that. We looked across the board and um, we identified students who had needs in for elementary reading, our phonological awareness and explicit phonics instruction, which are our foundational skills for our early learners and those in the upper grades who might still be facing challenges 
also reading comprehension and writing. Within those programs, we also had targeted intervention, and that includes Hegarty and Foundations, which are phonemic awareness and phonics interventions, and leveled literacy intervention, which focuses more on comprehension. Uh, for elementary math, we identified the focused domains based on our grade level data. So if we looked across the board at grade three and saw that our students were really not achieving as well in uh, geometry or in fractions or in multiplication, those were the focus um, domains for the instruction. Um, we kept our, our approach to use conceptual and computational uh, mastery and so we wanted to make sure that those both still remained and we had a targeted intervention called do the math that was infused into the program. So at the middle school level, um, our focus for language arts, and again, students were identified using their iReady scores uh, from that year. So for language arts, we focused really on argumentative writing, uh, vocabulary, and we did embed those SEL strategies as we did the summer prior. Um, we also focused on targeted reading interventions. So students who receive an intervention during the school year, who were invited and attended summer boost, received that same intervention. So there was no delay, no gap. They were continuing on the path that they were on where they left off at the end of the school year. So Wilson and Just Words um, were some of the interventions as well as leveled literacy intervention. Our teachers refer to that as LLI. Um, in middle school math, uh, we focused on computational fluency. That is really uh, an area that we identified as a need for our students. Um, problem solving strategies, of course, and then reasoning and modeling tasks. That is a huge focus for this school year. So we really wanted to work with students throughout the summer to make sure that they were ready for the upcoming school year. Um, because that is something we're focusing on this year in middle school. And then our targeted math interventions are uh, Number Worlds and My Path. My Path is an iReady um, intervention, so it is aligned directly with iReady. Uh, it identifies areas where students uh, need to, to have additional support or additional work, and then it sets them off on like an individualized uh, learning path. So as you can see with our numbers from this past summer, we had quite a few more students this summer than we've had in the previous two summers. Uh, this past summer we had uh, 2,350 students that we served compared to the year before it was 1, 000, uh, 1,700 students approximately and the year before that was 1,600. One of the reasons why we had so many more students this summer was we looked at our, our data from the previous school year and what we saw was uh, in 2022, we looked at students that were two or more grade levels behind. But when we looked at our data with our iReady data during the school year last year, what we noticed was a student that came in behind tended to remain behind on overall average wise. And so we looked at one grade level or below for this past summer and we included those students. So all students that were one grade or more below were invited to per, uh, participate in Summer Boost this past summer. I will say our attendance was really great for the first three weeks, just like in years prior, uh, but it tends to tail off uh, those last two weeks. Uh, students and families, I think, are ready to go on vacation, um, and we start to see that uh, happen. Um, so we are now looking at, for this coming summer, modifying uh, our summer boost program to really look at the trends over the last couple of summers and make sure that we get our bang for the buck and going forward. So I will be coming to the board uh, later in the year to talk about what summer boost will look like for this coming summer. So this lets us know whether summer boost was, was worth it for our students and whether the attending in the summer actually helps. And so what we do is we look at our iReady scores in the fall and we compare them to how they ended up in this, uh, the prior school year. So the spring iReady scores to the fall iReady scores to see whether there's been a huge drop because uh, there is some, such, uh, something called summer slide. It's real. Uh, many students that don't do something academic over the summer tend to fall behind and fall farther behind when they start the, the next school year. Um, and so the numbers represent the scores between the spring iReady and then how they started off in the fall iReady. And what you'll see is that the negative is that they did lose some ground um, and the positive is actually they gained some ground. 
And what you'll look at is the first column is the boost students, the students that participated in our summer boost this, this summer. The next one is no boost. Those are students that did not participate in our boost program. And that includes all the students that did not participate in summer boost. So even the students that were at grade level or above grade level uh, that were not invited because they weren't one or more grade levels behind. That includes all of those students. And then the third column is the national. And so based on iReady's data, uh, what they've looked at with all of the iReady's that they give nationally is you'll see the typical summer slide is that national one. So for example, for, the, for, for second grade, so our students fell behind by one, uh, but uh, the students that did not go to boost fell behind by three, and then nationally students typically fell behind by five. Um, so as you can see that our students that did participate in Boost, it actually had a, a positive impact uh, overall when you look at whether the program worked or didn't work. And you'll see that in most cases, the students that attended Boost did get a leg up and were able to start the year off and didn't go with the national summer slide or even the students that didn't participate in summer Boost. So we're very happy with the way the program ended up and uh, the data that we got. And so I just also want to say with the Boost students, it's the students that attended at any time during the summer. And we did have some students that, you know, it maybe attended the first week, but didn't attend the next four weeks. And so it does include all students that attended in the Boost program. Data. So you can see um, in the green area, the, those three columns, that's referring to middle school, summer school students, and the, the orange is high school, and then the blue is um, students or who took original credit courses. So those are all high school students. Um, you'll see in um, the trend from year to year starting in 2021. I think it's important to note that um, in the summer of 2021, our summer school program was virtual. Um, starting in 21-22, uh, we came back to in-person, so that would be the past this past summer as well as the summer before. Um, our original credit courses are virtual. They've remained virtual. Um, these are typically students who are um, selecting to take these courses, are students who want to free up some space in their schedule because they have other interests. Um, there's some program that they're involved in and they need to, to take a credit over the summer. Um, our pass rate, as you can see, for original credit is very high, 97% last summer, 95% uh, this summer. And um, you'll notice, I think, too, in, in the high school, columns uh, as we go from virtual to in back to in person we have much more success working with students in person than we did virtually uh, during that summer school summer that virtual summer for the original credit I, one of the reasons why we might have gone down from the prior summer is that we are offering more original credit during the school year for kids to take advantage of that as well and we've seen an increase in the numbers yes. that are actually taking yeah so now what happens with the data? Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ms. Hungerford. She'll talk about what we're doing right now this school year to help keep get our kids moving forward and catching them up okay. and moving them ahead. So the purpose of gathering this data is not just to inform the public. It has two primary purposes. One, to inform our parents and families of how their student is progressing, and two, to inform us so that we can make any adjustments we need to at the system, at the grade level, at the school, and even drill down to at the student level when we get to um, helping the schools. So our, our foci this year, and it's continuing, is primarily tier one instruction. And you may have heard me say before that our philosophy is strengthen the core. Um, last year when we presented on tutoring, Kim Hudler, our elementary content specialist for reading, said that her job was to put the ELO tutoring people out of business because you know we need to strengthen our course. So we are focusing on that with whole group instruction, uh, small group instruction when data indicates that small groups need help, and um, we do small group instruction for all students in reading and math. So at the class level, 
a teacher looks across the board and says, what domains, what indicators are our students doing well in? Where do they need a little more help? Where do I need to strengthen the instruction? specifically. And then with small group instruction, as we've reported before, we have small group for students that need some intervention or remediation, and we also have that for students who just need a little recursive practice and reinforcement, and then we have small group instruction for those students who are succeeding and we can enrich and accelerate their progress. We can offer individual support through our online platforms. Currently, elementary has My, Math, My Path to Reading and Dreambox for Math. And teachers have the ability to drill down in iReady data and take a look and say, Megan is really struggling with uh, multi-digit addition and assign lessons just on that to really focus on those skills and standards. We have in-school interventions, and those are being provided by our reading and math interventionists, our instructional leadership team members provide interventions, our special educators, including teachers and instructional assistants, can provide interventions, and they can do that across the board to all students. If they're working with a group of students with IEPs, they can include students without also, as long as the student-teacher ratio stays low. And then we have a huge focus on our extended learning opportunities. Um, our schools are very creative. They infuse social emotional learning in these to make students have a positive experience and not make it seem like an arduous additional task. Uh, they can do it before school or after school based on teacher, student, parent schedules and what's gonna work best for, the, for everyone. Some schools even do Saturday programs and our focus with those is um, we are really trying to get schools to do more high impact tutoring and they have come along and are doing an amazing job. And when we talk about high impact tutoring, that means we have a frequency of two to three times a week. We have a duration of at least 20 concurrent lessons and it's very focused on a specific need. We um, are able to, and I really don't know how they're doing this, but the schools are doing an amazing job. They're getting daily tutors that are um, certified teachers. Many, many of these are our retired folks who don't necessarily want to come back to teach full time, although we'd like that too. <laughs> but um, they just want to work two or three days a week. So, um, you know, the principals kind of, when anybody says they're retiring, they say, okay, well, I've got a gig for you next year. Let's talk about it now. And then we also contract with FEV and Amplify uh, platforms, which are virtual platforms that provide virtual tutoring. And those can be done during the day, during small group instruction, when the students aren't meeting with the teacher, or they can also be infused as before and after school programs. And we have a lot of schools participating in all those models right now. Um, and the data that we're seeing shows the, that it's meeting success. I'd like to just thank the principals of the elementary level. They really are doing a great job this year of getting more and more of these programs up and running earlier. And many of our students are going to be able to take advantage of these extra programs. <laughs> At the secondary level, um, we do a lot of the same things. So we're focusing on that tier one instruction and really um, strengthening that core, making sure that teachers are really understanding their content standards and that um, students, when they're assessing students, they're assessing to see whether or not they have gained mastery of that standard. Um, when we do find that there are students who didn't understand a particular concept, uh, then Teachers are pulling those small groups to do uh, structured um, reteaching with them, reassessment, uh, enrichment, depending on what their needs are. Um, you don't see as much small group instruction at the secondary level as you do in elementary for sure, but it's something that um, really does work with secondary students, of course, and, and we're working with teachers all the time to figure out ways to manage that in the classroom. Um, we do have individual support going on through a few um, online platforms, and these are really focused on student need. So my path, again, um, we're using for math at the secondary level. Um, we're looking at students' uh, skill deficits. We're looking at where they need to um, 
you know, strengthen and, and then they're on that individualized uh, MyPath platform. MyPath can also be used to excel, help accelerate students depending on where they are. Um, we are also using this year for the first time at a few select middle schools an iReady teacher toolbox. Um, this again is just another tool for teachers to use that really helps them drill down uh, to look at student needs and then provide instruction in just that specific area, so isolating that skill. Um, same thing with the teacher tools for instruction. Now the teacher tools for instruction are available to any teacher. So they can look at their entire class, they can look at um, what needs their students have, and then they can group students accordingly and provide direct instruction for that particular skill. Um, in ELA, we use Common Lit and Common Lit focused assessments um, and lessons. And those are, again, it's an online platform that's really focused on standards based instruction. Um, for in school intervention, so a little bit deeper, we have the labs at the middle school level. So this was a change last year where we really took apart that 90 minute math and ELA block and we looked at just doing um, a class for the core instruction and then students who need intervention or students who need enrichment go into a lab course. So those students are placed um, using a variety of assessment tools, right? So we're not just looking at iReady, we're looking at how they did on MCAP, we're looking at uh, classroom assessments, we're looking at the student as a whole and really identifying if they could benefit from that lab or intervention. Um, we do have our ILT members at the middle school level. They are teaching two periods a year. Sorry, two periods a day. This year is what I meant to say, not two periods a year. So they've really become our master teachers. So what we're hoping um, schools will start doing with these master teachers is having their other staff come in and watch them and really observe effective instruction and what that looks like. Um, and then of course at the high school level, we still have the high school resource teachers. They're again, they're also master teachers going in and assisting um, our new, our new folks. And then of course we have our special educators and our special ed IAs who are helping to provide that really specific, really targeted um, instruction and intervention. We also have extended learning opportunities going on at the secondary level. A lot of times in secondary land this looks like recovery opportunities. So grade recovery, you didn't pass first quarter, what can we do to help you bring that grade up so that you have a fighting chance of passing that course for the year. So we have grade recovery and then credit recovery at the high school level um, at every school in our system, every secondary school. In addition to that, we have a number of schools that are running Saturday programs and those are usually pretty all encompassing. So they have, um, a student who was assigned to Saturday school for a, a disciplinary consequence. We have tutoring programs going on on Saturdays, but the student who's there for the disciplinary consequence might as well be a part of that tutoring opportunity because they're there anyways. And so they're kind of um, trying to grab as many students as possible. We're emphasizing the high, Im high dosage, high impact tutoring. So again, um, we're hoping for at least three sessions a week, uh, 20 sessions total. Uh, more often than not, at the middle and high school level, it looks like two sessions a week, depending on when they can get those students in. Our secondary schools have some in-person uh, certified tutors coming in. A lot of times we see those tutors going into the AVID classrooms, uh, but more so they're using our FEV online tutors. And we're working with FEV, individual schools are customizing their programs. Some of them are offering that intensive intervention um, and tutoring during the school day. So they've been able to build it in either to the lab courses in middle school or during their activity period, or even some core classes at the high school level. So um, folks have gotten really creative this year, so I'm really curious to see what the data looks like at the end of the year after um, students have participated in all these programs. And while we're doing all those things to make sure students are getting the services they need, we're also focusing on strengthening our teachers' effectiveness. Um, and professional knowledge. So we have a two-pronged approach at both levels. Uh, we are focusing, as I just said, on strengthening the core instruction. So all of our curriculum and programs are um, delivered with fidelity and integrity and student, or 
teachers are staying on pace because sometimes if we get really far behind, we, have, we, we cause gaps further because we haven't gotten to units. So our core programs, just to remind you, are into reading for K to five reading and literacy, um, illustrative math for K to five math, and Connect for Learning, which is a fully integrated pre-kindergarten program used system-wide. We provide these sessions at our countywide in-service days. Um, we also have embedded professional learning at the schools <coughs> by the instructional leadership teams and by the professional learning ship teams, which is our system initiative um, this year on writing, but also transcends all the content areas. And we have teacher coaching. ILT members are trained coaches, and then we've also, through some of our grant opportunities, been able to contract um, coaches coming from these vendors who are professional coaches and are coming in. Um, just as an aside with that, the schools that we targeted were the schools that have the greatest number of um, less experienced teachers. So three or less years, conditional, long-term subs, things like that. So those individuals that might need a little more assistance than at a school that has a, a veteran staff. And we're also um, working with our teachers across the board to make them really understand, and again, this is our attempt to alleviate the need for students to have intervention by catching students' difficulties before they really become anything bigger. So we want them to understand how children are learning, what's happening in their brain when that, when that learning occurs. So we are currently uh, getting ready to finish our all teachers pre-K through three will have had letters training, as will your superintendent of schools. Every Tuesday or Thursday night. <laughs> um, that is language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. It drives me crazy that the acronym is spelled incorrectly for the word letters, but I have to get over it. Um, and that is directly aligned to the science of reading. And that's very powerful. I went through letters um, a number of years ago, and it really, for somebody who was already a certified reading specialist, it gives you more information than that you thought you knew it all and you did not. And then we also have an, an initiative that we're in our second or third year of implementing and we're really trying to build this across the board and it's called OGAP, Ongoing Assessment Project. And this is a fabulous training. Um, it, it teaches teachers the math trajectories and help them see the progressions in math learning. So if a child is having challenges in multi-digit addition, it might be something that they are missing or they have a misconception of two or three years back. And it helps teachers kind of dissect that, pull it apart and say, okay, where is the misconception? And once you fix that, that learning can just accelerate right on up. So um, we are doing that right now. We've done many summer sessions that honestly were so well attended. People signed up for one and then they came back for the second and third because we um, offer it in additive, multiplicative, and fractional, those three strands. And we have Saturday sessions going on this year throughout the year where teachers come the first Saturday of every month and you would think we wouldn't have a lot of takers, and we have many, many participants engaged in that. I am proud to say that in the state of Maryland, Charles County has the highest number of um, individuals who are trained OGAP trainers. They're, they're approved OGAP trainers. Um, they are a, a large number of our instructional resource teacher team at the elementary level, so we have achieve the way to provide this without having to hire more costly contractors because we can we can build our capacity from within so at the secondary level um, again we're using the common lit 360 that's the ela curriculum um, and one of our most commonly used resources and then at the for math we're using illustrative math um, so we are now fully implemented with illustrative math in middle school. 
we've rolled it out for Algebra 1 and this year for Geometry. Next year we're looking to go to Algebra 2. So we're speaking the same language to students from the time they start in school all the way up through high school and they get ready for those really advanced levels of math. Um, and we're hoping to see uh, a huge change in our scores because of this as time goes on. In addition, we have our countywide professional learning sessions, in-service sessions. We're embedding professional learning at schools and typically your ILT teams at the middle school level and your PLTs are really taking on that embedded school day um, professional learning. And then as Megan mentioned, at the elementary level, uh, we also have the content embedded coaching going on at the middle school level of one of our high schools. So we've really looked at and identified and targeted a school um, because they had the most number of uncertified teachers or new teachers. And we have this uh, company part, paired up with those teachers and um, they're walking the walk with them, co-teaching with them, planning with them, doing all those things during the school day. It's job embedded. Um, so we are also um, just continuing to build capacity with our teachers. We have a number of new teachers, so we are leaning on our veteran teachers to be the models for those uh, brand new and young teachers. So we're doing illustrative math training at all levels. Um, sixth grade all the way up through geometry. Our math professional learning this year is really focused on modeling and reasoning. We talk about um, really dissecting where students have issues and misconceptions in math at the middle school level. It is that reasoning and modeling uh, uh, content area, concept. Um, we're uh, doing targeted professional learning across the system, as you know, but we're really looking to unpack standards. And so our content specialists, when they work with our teachers in small groups, that's what their focus is on, making sure that they truly understand their content standard and that they're delivering um, instruction that is at the level of grade level, that grade level standard. And then um, we are also going out with the iReady team to some schools and just our own teams to different schools to unpack and dive into their data, their iReady data, but also their MCAP data, so they can really understand what student needs are and how to move forward and what that means for their instruction. So this slide is more of a reminder for families that we did send home on October 10th uh, an email explaining how they could access their, their children's uh, iReady reports that were sent home. Um, we did have an iReady night last week um, where we explained how you can get these reports and what the reports mean and then we gave some resources uh, to families to uh, target a resource as to they could look at the report and then determine what extra help and extra supports they could provide their sons and daughters and, and guardians at home. So uh, that will be on our website um, so parents can access that again and get the resources and see what's out there to help support their, their children at home. At this time, we'd like to take questions. All right, very informative, thank you. Um, Ms. Brother Washington. Yes, it was very informative. And um, I'm gonna start off by saying, looking at the numbers, I was a little sad there for a minute. <laughs> so, um, but the programs and all of the tools that you have for the children, that was enlightening because it says that we're going to get to the, you're going to close that gap that we need to, clap, to close. And furthermore, I just want to say this for the public, there was already a gap before COVID. So what happened was COVID widened that gap. So we just got to work a little harder. So all the programs that you have put forth, are, are mind-boggling and it's great and the only thing I will hope is that the teachers and the parents will have an agreement to identify the children that need the help and they can come up with a game plan and stick with it because what it does it closes the gap for that child and if they can stick for it with a year you can say you can see light at the at the end and so it will be uh uh, great for the child because you only want to look for the student and say it's great for the student you might not can't go to a summer that year but for my child a summer I can go without that summer long as he or she is putting in the work and I can see progress and it's going to make it better so that's the only thing I would wish is that you know that contract between the parent 
and the teacher that they, you know, identify the child and make that happen for them. Because if we all do that at the end, or well, graduation, we all be petting Dr. DeVar on the back and saying, job well done, because <laughs> all the kids will have it up there. So that's my thing. But great programs, and I love everything that you're doing. So sad, but now I'm happy. So I, <laughs> we can go forth from there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Warren. Uh, one question. You mentioned unpacking standards. I was like, oh, yeah. So that's professional development that you're doing with the teachers? Yes. So, so yeah. quick, real, real quick question before I forget. Um, <laughs> Do you all use the, um, what is it, Understanding by Design Curriculum Framework by ch any chance? We do, uh, okay. specifically with our special ed uh, teachers. Okay. Yes. So how do you plan to, um, what, what kind of tools or, you know, uh, frameworks do you use to help unpack the uh, standards? So our focus this year, um, countywide, is really focusing on standards-based instruction. So um, we're looking at specifically writing standard two, and we're walking teachers and teams of administrators and teachers from each school through what that looks like, um, how to um, in increase students' ability to write to inform through writing standard two, and we start every session by unpacking that standard and using a process to really go through it. We also purchased for um, schools, not necessarily for every teacher, but for reference at the schools, uh, some text called Common Core Companions, which go through, mm -hmm. and if you guys would like to see a sample copy, we can drop a sample off to um, Ms. Stubblefield for you to review. But it literally goes through, in the grade level bands, it goes through every single standard in every single content area, yes. and it goes through and it, it really annotates and highlights. And it helps teachers understand what that standard means, what you can do to address it, and very importantly, um, it helps teachers understand, and we are also doing this through PLT, to understand what the progression is among the standards. Mm -hmm. So if I teach third grade and my students come in, I need to fully understand where they're coming from, what they learned in second grade, or I'm gonna do it over and assume they don't, what I need to have them master in third grade and what their goals are gonna be in fourth grade yes. and how those, how those build along um, the grade levels. Because at the end of, at the end of their school career, they are gonna attain for college and career readiness an anchor standard mm -hmm. that and then is back mapped all the way down to pre-K. Yes. And they take it a step at a time mm -hmm. and we help them to understand that. Oh, that is excellent. And that's at both the secondary and you're talking about elementary as well, mm -hmm. yes. teachers. That's Across awesome. the system. Part of that work okay. is actually looking at student work mm -hmm. and getting a common understanding of is the, the work that we're viewing at standard, and if not, what needs to happen to get there. And the other part is to get in and out of classrooms. Mm -hmm. So we are in the process right now of t taking uh, teacher leadership teams around to different schools and getting in and out of classrooms and having that discussion, but also principals are in the process of going around together and getting in and out of classrooms and having that discussion too. So it's not only actually teaching what the standard is, but actually having discussion based on student work and what observations are seen in classrooms. Excellent. Just real quick, I had a question about the Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. I heard you all mention something about 8th grade, and then there's like a little pause. What do they learn in ninth grade? Ninth grade math, is that? It depends on whether or not a student took Algebra 1 in 8th or okay. whether they're slated to take it in ninth grade. Oh, okay. so, so as Mr. Roberts said, we had about 30% of our students um, taking Algebra 1 in eighth grade. Okay. Um, those students are a little bit more accelerated, and but the typical path is Algebra 1 in ninth grade. So if students take it in eighth grade, then in ninth grade they're taking geometry, mm -hmm. then they go on to Algebra 2 and they can access those higher levels of math. Okay. We're also offering geometry now as an, as an original credit option. So students who may not have been accelerated in middle school, they're taking Algebra 1 as a ninth grader, uh, but they're doing very well, they're very successful, and they want to move on and really get to those higher level courses, they can take geometry as original credit over the summer and then jump into Algebra 2 as a 10th grader. Yeah, because looking at the data, it was a little scary. I'm like, well, what happened between? And I thought about geometry. I was just wanting clarification. Between Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, the disconnect, and you know, just with the data, so I thought I'd ask. But thank you. What you're going to see next year is we are going to have students taking actually the geometry test because 
Uh, part of our plan for college and career readiness is for students that don't pass it in Algebra 1, they will take it in geometry. Ms. Smith. I uh, wanted to say, of course, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think this is very just critical for the board to understand as well as for the public to understand, especially when we look at our budget and we try to figure out, like, what are the priorities of the school system? Where are we investing our time, our money, our technology, our people? And then what data sort of drives that? This is a presentation that really speaks to me in terms of how, what, what's driving that. And then do we hit the mark? We invested in summer booths. Did we hit the mark or not in certain areas? So appreciate kind of the breakdown throughout. So just a few questions, um, if the chairman will allow me some grace, because I have a few. Um, <laughs> Before you start, Mr. Schwartz, are we? It's almost time. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the first one was, you mentioned earlier in the presentation about suppressed data, if they were sort of below 5% in, in a particular category. Can you just explain what a suppressed data means, both for the county as well as for the state? Yeah, the idea behind it is that because the numbers are so few, it would lend itself to being able to determine which students actually perform at that particular level. So that's why they suppress data for certain subgroups or for certain achievement levels, because they don't want to be able to identify students at one level or not. Understood. Okay. The numbers are just so low, you'd be yes. able to begin to identify. 5% or 95%, one, one direction or the other, or students in a subgroup of 10 or fewer. On slide four, there was a decline in Algebra 1 that I noted. And I was just curious if there were any, it was slide four. There was an Algebra 1 decline. Was it Algebra 2? There was the increase in Algebra 1, but there was a decline in Algebra 2. Yeah. Okay. And I was just curious if we had any sort of data in looking at that, like what was the, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word, um, do we have like any root causes to understand why that may have happened? Yeah, one concern is, as Mr. Lowndes indicated, was that students usually take a break year because they take their algebra in ninth grade, then they take algebra two in that 10th grade year, so they have that year where they don't even assess at, in math at the, at the uh, state level so making that change to when students are in high school to to meet that ESSA standard which is that they have to take a high school math testing them in geometry right out of their end of their ninth grade year we think we have an impact on how well they're going to do on that okay for slides five through seven really appreciated the breakdown by school um, I'm just curious kind of what is the support or even the expectation of principals and building leaders to be able to communicate this information back to families to help them understand kind of within our specific school, this has been our growth. This is what we believe the growth is a tribute to. Um, any thoughts on sort of how that works or what the expectation is? For the schools? Well, one of the things is the schools were asked with their school improvement plan to share what they're doing within their school uh, and what their focus is. And on the elementary, their, their goals are related to math and reading. And so the idea is that during that presentation that they will share what they're doing to improve the math and reading scores within their schools. Is there an expectation that it's year-round conversations or is this just it's in the school improvement plan? So right now it, it, we are uh, in the process of tweaking and working with our school improvement plan, but it's, it's really a, a cycle of learning and that we're teaching our schools to go through and that you're constantly looking and monitoring at data and making adjustments. Um, are we there yet where we have a finished product and everyone's doing everything? Um, not quite, um, but we're in the process of making sure that people understand the cycle of learning and that they're following the process and they're constantly looking at student data and they're making tweaks to their plan and to make sure that the student improvement is going forward. And really getting folks to understand where the extended learning opportunities right. fall into the school improvement plan and where the, the core instruction falls into the school improvement plan and getting everyone to understand where your uh, focus and uh, strategy within your building falls in with that plan as well and that you're constantly looking at student data and looking at where you are uh, because we all know where we want to go and that's everyone passing the state test at the end of the year. And I think that's what I was alluding to, is just ensuring that principals are able to speak directly to that in terms of in their building, and that families are able to understand it in a digestible way, that they feel confident in sort of what's taking place in their school relative to the scores that all the students are getting. 
Um, as a follow-up to that, just specific to slides five and seven, are there opportunities for principals to do some peer learning? Um, I mean, I'm just seeing there's some magic happening at Craig for math, Pickawaxen, North Point. Uh, there was some um, for Davis in Algebra One. Just curious if there's an opportunity for principals to come together to figure out like what's happening in those specific schools that's causing the numbers. So they do have opportunities to discuss amongst themselves right now. The principals are participating, like I said, in walkthroughs with, with other principals to look what's going on in other buildings and have the discussions as to what's taking place in each building. And then I know Dr. Jones gives opportunities for principals to talk about best practices at the principal meetings. We also have a system of guided visits where they are able to bring their entire professional learning team um, our first rotation of those is, is just going on right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the administrators, but it's uh, teachers also who get to come and walk through other classrooms and see what's going on and, um, and really reflect on, on what is working well and what they want to adopt, for lack of a better term, borrow. And, and borrow. <laughs> copy um, <laughs> and take back to their school but this is this is a practice that is promoted because if Melissa has figured it out it shouldn't be a secret right I should be trying it to talk a little bit about the structural leadership team meetings and how they're built around that as well right um, our ILT our instructional leadership team also comes together about once a month mm -hmm. and so that's a representative from every school and they sit together and they talk about um, in their particular discipline, whether it be reading, math, or gifted and enrichment, they talk about um, their successes, their challenges, mm -hmm. they brainstorm, they, um, they help each other to come up with solutions, um, and, and then they can carry that back to their schools. So they also have a very collaborative approach. There are times that um, we don't have anything structured, but there are times when if we see a school that's really struggling, we might say, you know, you should contact your colleague at School X mm -hmm. and see if you can just shadow her for a day and see how, how she's doing and what she's doing so you can bring some ideas back. We really just recommend that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's not a structured, formal, scheduled thing, but, but it also does exist. And sometimes they seek it out themselves. Sometimes they'll say, who, who knows what, and, and I, can I come and spend a half a day with you? No, I appreciate those structured, you know, pair and share opportunities uh, between building leaders. Wanting to jump quickly to slide 17 in terms of the gains and losses for, from the summer boost. And just a quick kudos, heard a lot of great feedback from the community in terms of the summer boost and the opportunities that were offered. So just wanting to give kudos to Dr. Navarro, to the team, um, definitely well done in terms of what was offered and the execution of it. I'm just curious if there are any, like what's the hypothesis for the summer gains and losses specifically where there are no positive gains or there was a decline in gains? Like, is there any theory there? So we are looking at that data now. We just received this data on Friday. Um, from <laughs> from iReady, um, and so we were happy we got it on Friday to make sure that we could present it to you today, and we were hoping that we were going to have positive data, um, so knock on wood. Uh, the majority of it but, is. But, it's just but a few we will outliers. now be looking and breaking down kind of what the data is telling us. Another thing, too. I think the puzzle nationally and here as well is math, I mean, yeah. to be honest, and I think mm -hmm. we have to... We're only in our third year in most grade levels, but not in the high school grade levels, of having, uh, I think, a curriculum that's conceptual mathematics at its core. Um, and a lot of people are turning to math resources that are a little different. Uh, but math is a puzzling beast because of that. And I, I'm not, a, we need a little bit more time, but I'm not 100% um, sure that a five week program is as impactful as a strong three-week program or as a strong two-week program. Mm. Um, and, you know, we'll come and ask uh, as we review this data a little bit more. But it's, it's you know, you see the national declines. Right. It's just this, this piece. And this is everything from the kid who mm. is a couple, like a year or, or so behind to the kid that's doing all kinds of activities and enrichments and everything else. There still is a, is a regression summer 
regression that happens specifically in math. So. And it also is the hardest teacher to find, hmm. a math teacher, a certified math teacher or a math major. Um, there's plenty of jobs, opportunities for people that major in math. And so we, it's also, you know, the biggest target that we have in our professional learning is working with our math teachers and providing opportunities for them to interact with the curriculum and really understand how to deliver the curriculum with fidelity. No, certainly. Um, I'm definitely interested to see sort of what you all come up with for this next coming iteration of summer boost opportunities, given what we're looking at here. Uh, just three more quick questions. Uh, there was a mention of the iReady teacher toolbox is only in some schools. I'm curious kind of what's going to be the impetus to kind of offer it to all schools. So we, one thing that we do do is, is we pilot things before we go full bore and buy a ton kind. of it. And so <laughs> we had our, uh, Sheila Heddle come and came to us and asked if we'd be willing to try it um, in some of the schools to see whether it's effective or not effective. And if it is effective, then we will look at branching out and buying it for other schools. Certainly. Uh, uh, huh. At all levels. Okay. Um, lab, the math lab classes. Quick kudos. Uh, as a parent who has two students in middle school lab, love that you all are using the data to guide the sort of breakdown of the math element from core instruction to those who need additional supports versus enrichment. Love that you're sort of looking at the data in that way. Um, is that offered at all the middle schools? Yes, so last year we piloted it uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to make sure that this was the direction that we wanted to go. We really wanted to look at, at student data at the end of the year. We saw significant gains. So we um, expanded to all of the middle schools this year. Yeah, it's going really well. And my last question, and I thank you to my colleagues for giving me this time. Letters and OGAP, love that we are focusing on, again, how to continue to build the core of our instructional leaders um, and ensuring that they have the best training that can be offered. Curious if there's any thought about offering it to parents. Um, with parents being the, the first teacher, just curious if there is opportunity for parents to better understand how to break down standards, how to do some of this work at home with their students, with their child. <laughs> So we're not ready to talk about that yet, um, but uh, enough to say is that it? there is work happening to do some parent engagement that we're gonna start doing around uh, reading. We may get maybe some funding support. Um, so we're not ready to talk about that, but absolutely there is a lot of work happening behind the scenes on some decisions we're gonna do. Um, starting very young with our pre kers and even younger to get our families um, to help us build some foundations and support foundations. We're just not quite ready to talk about it yet. No, I appreciate that we're on the same wavelength and something is afoot. So, you know, because it's more than just sending your child to their special corner to read or do that special math that only you know how to do. Right. Um, so just making sure families are brought in for support. And, and Ms. Smith, if I could add, when I look at the summer gains losses and I look at the national numbers, just not even looking just at Charles County, the math is so significantly not as good as the reading. And I think that's because parents are much more comfortable reading with children, sure. and doing those things and taking them to the library, Certainly. you know, but who's going to, who's going to take their sixth grader and say, let's do some fraction work you know, this July. <laughs> Just one of us. <laughs> Other than Mr. Roberts. So I think when, when summer at-home learning occurs, it's much more concentrated, at least for the elementary level, in the reading and literacy than it would be in math or another content area. Certainly. Thank you again. Thanks. Questions? If we could try to be brief, because we do have one speaker for public comment, Mr. Schwartz told me. So Ms. Kramer? No problem. Ms. Smith asked most of the questions that I had, so thank you, Ms. Smith. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all for this presentation. I think it's very comprehensive, and it's really helpful to hear um, from different vantage points um, as a parent, as a board member, and I think also for the benefit of the public. Um, my son also attended Summer Boost last summer, and um, that coupled with the math lab that's now being offered in middle school, I feel like is really gonna help him because he is one of these kids that is struggling with math and um, doing really well in reading. But that math, you know, he's still struggling with some concepts that I think were missed 
probably somewhere throughout the COVID or post COVID years. Um, so just really appreciate you, you um, illustrating all of the multiple opportunities because as parents, we know the gaps are there, um, but to see a plan and a very detailed plan, I think is really helpful for parents um, and for the public, you know, to see that yes, you know, some of the numbers are truly you know, disheartening, but um, to see that there is a plan and that we're going to continue to use the data um, to drive these interventions. And I'm really just happy to hear that. Uh, I can't wait to hear what's going to happen with Summer Boost um, next year and, and the different um, things that you have planned. So just wanted to thank you for that. Also wanted to just um, plug that my son has one of the international teachers um, for Math Lab this year, and um, that's been really, really helpful to him um, so far. So really um, grateful for that opportunity, and I thought that was a great idea um, to separate Math Lab because um, it's really hard with that. It's it's so important that math for those blocks, but it's also difficult to maintain their focus for that long. So separating that and providing an opportunity where he just works in small groups most of the time in Math Lab um, is really helpful. And so I just want to say kudos to everyone who um, was instrumental in developing this um, in, in the pilot and assessing it and then deploying it to all of our middle schools because I truly think it's going to be a game changer. So really appreciate you all for that. Um, and I, I too was looking at the numbers in Summer Boost, but as I said, Ms. Smith asked um, the question I had, which was some of the outliers like sixth grade math and eighth grade ELA that had a higher gain for no boost than if they took boost. So I'm just curious about what you uncover from that. So I will, I'll wait for, um, you know, future presentations on that. Um, but again, just want, you know, to thank you all. And this is really illustrative of the fact that we're being very intentional. Um, and a lot of parents asked me about boost, you know, this past summer and wanted to know, well, how do we know what to work with or what our kids are going to be um, taught and what interventions are going to be applied and, and how, do, how do we know how the lessons are being developed. And you really explained that today. So I just thank you again for that. Thanks, Ms. Morley. Yes, um, to echo what my colleague said, um, very much appreciate this because, as you know, at the end of the day, the data drives everything. Um, I also fully understand, as you do, that not all students test well. So you do have to take that into account, that you know, there are plenty of students that can explain to you how to do said math problem, but maybe have test anxiety or any number of reasons why they may not have performed well. Um, with that said, I agree with what my colleague said. It, it is disheartening, I mean, just, just being candid. Um, I do appreciate that you all are being proactive and that you're not just saying, well, we know it's probably going to be bad. Let's just wait and see. And I think that's going to help mitigate a lot of um, just candidly the damage that may have occurred. Um, and just speaking from personal experience, at the state of the schools, when we went to the breakout sessions and I met with um, my uh, son's um, schools, um, shout out to Ms. Hungerford. She did a fantastic job of just breaking it down. Not, not, not that, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> <laughs> the other Ms. Hungerford. <laughs> Although I have to give you a shout out separately. But, um, and I, I did not, and I don't think, just speaking that the small group that was in there, I don't think anyone left there feeling hopeless or anyone left there feeling like there's nothing that can happen for my student. I mean, she really took the time to answer. Admittedly, my son had four or five questions about PBIS, just sidebar. <laughs> But she really took the time to explain, these are your options. If your student is struggling, if they're struggling in X, Y, and Z, pick one. This is what we're offering them. And my son has the opposite problem to Ms. Ms. Kramer's son. He's doing great in math, but has always hated reading. And so there's a fight. But I had something for him. So when I went to that iReady <laughs> webinar, and um, it reinforced about one, just shout out to you all. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of great questions answered. And when they reinforced about the FEV tutoring, I said, hmm, let me just see. I emailed them Thursday night and that next day, Friday, he may not have been happy, but I was thrilled. He had a tutor. And they're like, do you want to do five days a week, six days a week, seven days a week? I was like, oh, man. So um, I, can, I can speak from personal experience. They're quick responses. They can get your child in pretty quickly. He's already feeling more confident, which I think for a lot of these kids is a, a lot of the problem. So I thank you all very much for this. Um, curious about the Saturday programs that might be in the minority, but I can ask you all offline. I understand the interests of, of time. As I'm the one that, you know, school is your job as a student. 
you know, we don't want to burn you out, but we do want to consistently reinforce because I've seen the summer slide. So I completely understand. It's a very real thing. And um, to Ms. I think Ms. Kramer's point and Dr. Navarro's point, I'm also curious to see what summer boost is going to look like and would it be potentially a longer day of, you know, fewer weeks? Uh, you know, does it really make a difference? So thank you all again. This was great. Thanks. All right. Appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Yeah. Shorts. Identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. When appropriate, CCPS staff may address the speaker's concerns directly. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education-related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. This evening, we have one speaker signed up, Tina Wilson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tina Wilson, and I reside in District 1. And while I'm think, thinking about it, a couple weeks ago, I had the pleasure of going over to St. Charles to see the, the all-county thespian play, A Chorus Line. It was awesome. Um, so I know this buys into my three minutes. But <laughs> having said all of that, I know you've, you guys, it's been a long night, a uh, long day. It's my understanding that a process is underway by the Board of Ed to decide on a replacement of a District 1 board member who stepped down several months ago. I want to bring to your attention a couple things. I was surprised to find that the virtual option sign up had closed on Friday, hence the reason why I'm standing before you today. I would recommend that it be reinstated so that sign ups close on the day of the public forum. Parents working outside the county would probably benefit, benefit from having this option. It's also my understanding that interviews were conducted on October 20th for the District 1 replacement and recorded. I'm sorry I missed the live interview. I think many others did so as well because of competing priorities. When I checked this morning, the link on the Charles County Public Schools YouTube website showed several events but not to interviews. I think these interviews will be very useful for the public. Let me be clear. I understand the law gives you the authority to make this important decision on who replaces this District 1 seat. But the community deserves the opportunity to express their preference. So creating a little time on your calendar for public comment after the videos are posted, I think would be a wise investment. With that said, and because the process is not exactly clear on what the next steps are, such as public participation, I don't know when it's going to be, I'm going to take the opportunity to press, um, present mine. And I'm going to make the recommendation that Jennifer Abel, who has extensive experience in school board policy, as well as parliamentarian procedures, without question, would make a great choice. We, many in the community in District 1 uh, can accept the, the idea or the notion that during a normal election process, she would wholeheartedly win the support and confidence of District 1. So thank you for this opportunity to come, come before you to express my personal choice, but I strongly encourage you to afford the citizens of District 1 their opportunity to express their preference. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. That was our only speaker. Thank you. All right, thanks. 
Uh, you know what, let's take a quick break. And we'll come back at 6.30. Hey, welcome back everyone we're going to pick up on the agenda so next up is the board handbook and uh, we can talk about this a little if you want but um, I'd like to thank Dr. Navarro or Shelley um, for making this look nice um, formatting it and uh, for everyone that had comments um, so we're going to have this and, uh, for our board retreat, and this was sent um, to the facilitator of the retreat, so we'll have something to talk to. And it's, you know, it's a draft document. It's a living document. But um, if, if you have any you know, big comments, if there's something glaring that's there, please point it out. But otherwise, this is just for reference, so we'll have something to speak to when we get together at the retreat. Yeah. One quick question. Yes, Ms. Warren. The communication where it's talked about communications, you know, between the superintendent and the board member. Where is it? Um, I, I didn't see any distinction, and I don't know that it should be when it comes to like the chair meeting with the superintendent or the board or the vice chair meeting with the superintendent. Does that need to be like clarified, or is that just? A so I think. Or did I miss something? Part. We talked about. Yeah, further down mm -hmm. at the board. Um, on the next page, it talks about the board, the chair, and the vice, the mm -hmm. board chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent. Um, having agenda setting meetings. Okay. So it specifically calls out those meetings okay um to happen and then to your point though we do have weekly meetings where minutes are taken and distributed to the rest of the board um but that's something we could we could certainly put in there too um oh okay Okay, wait a minute. I was looking at two different parts. All right. Yeah. Um, well, that but, is clear. Yeah, um, for agenda study meetings. But um, no, but you bring up a good point. I mean, we could we could certainly put something in there since you know it's been an ongoing practice to have weekly meetings with the um, superintendent. We could put something in there to reflect that as well. I think I was just thinking about the part where I read something about. Let me see. Um, Basically, if we wanted to bring some, like if I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one with the superintendent, it's really not to make requests or to share or to, what, how did it word it? Or all to. All the information will be shared with all the board. Correct. Yeah, I was just wondering about that. Um, okay. You know, if I had a specific uh, topic that I was interested in, of course I can't find it right now, but it just basically said don't talk to the superintendent about things that, you person I don't want to say personally but maybe an individual passion um, or a topic that you're interested in um, instead bring it up before the board All right is that right um, let me see. so is it you're looking under the the communications maybe, part yeah let me see no, 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 no. let me see maybe under individual board and member requests yeah. individual board member requests uh, that first paragraph. Let's see. I'm so, the yeah. Well, not not to speak for the superintendent, but feel free to talk to the superintendent whenever you would like. She would gladly entertain oh, that. Okay. Future. No, you can do that whenever you'd want. Um, I think the, the the distinction there is is task an individual tasking the superintendent or staff for something that may not necessarily be a board um, agenda. A request. board position or opinion okay um okay good yes okay thanks anything else from anybody miss um smith uh thank you chairman i'm just curious about the repercussions in the event that a board member does not adhere to what's here in the handbook so 
some but not all of what's in here is in policy so you know there depending on what it is there are things in policy that that outline um, repercussions for violation of that policy uh, to your question though that would be whatever the board wishes to place in the document okay. I mean there wasn't anything that struck me as <clears throat> counter to how we should conduct ourselves individually as mm -hmm. adults but also as elected officials also jointly as a board or collectively as a board but I was just curious about then what is the stick if you will um, in the event that someone does not follow what's already been established that we've eventually will collectively collectively excuse me agree to All right. no I'll, I'll repeat my first statement it's whatever the board wants to make it <laughs> and so <laughs> and so it, um, if there's you know it obviously um, if there if it's again refers back to policy and and there's already a mechanism for things that are in policy um, you may have to develop another policy that points specifically to the board handbook right and talk about if there if you violate things in the board handbook since there are some things in there that are not any place else um, in, in board policy nope that's helpful that's what I was looking for thank yeah. you okay that's just my opinion mr. Schwartz tell me if I'm wrong but <laughs> miss Morley just, I was going to just touch, I, I see the special note on page 10 that if the board members should, you know, not adhere to the protocols established by the governing board, the board chair, blah, 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 it will meet with the board member to address the issue. Um, is that what you were referring to, Ms. Ms. Smith, something along those lines? Or you it was, it was, and I was, I think looking for more teeth. Okay. So I'll use myself as, as an example. Um, this obviously won't happen because, you know, I'm me. But if I were to just abscond and do something completely different, I want to do my own thing, I'd completely violate what's in here. Mm -hmm. Is it just a conversation with you and Chairman Lucas as a verbal reprimand? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything additional that would keep me in line with what we have collectively established? Okay, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, so I, I think that's something we could, we could discuss. We, we could discuss. I, yeah. my, my initial response would be, if, if there's an issue, then everyone needs to know about it, not just certain <coughs> people. So I, I wouldn't necessarily use, use your example as one that, that we should follow. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah. A suggestion, Chairman, if we could maybe pull out the relevant policies and have that be part of the retreat. As I know, a couple of them are referenced, but. Um, so they, those were in, so a couple of them are in here. Okay, yeah, I see like the board bylaw 9000, but that's not like a no. specific, you know what I mean? Like that's the series. Seven, on page seven, the confidentiality policy is, is so, out. So I, I sent the board something earlier today yeah, of, um, to um, as I read this and as also I prepare for the retreat. Mm -hmm. um, and I sent a compilation of okay, I see um, what you're about. policies that we probably as a team need to do a walkthrough, a cross walkthrough. First of all, that we, we don't have something in policy that we would be violating or in contradiction in the handbook. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think part of the retreat is talking about and learning from how boards um, manage themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's the process for that? I mean, we have an ethics policy, we have a series of policies um, and so from me, I think you got a, uh, you know, some technical things of the document. And then I think I sent you like 10 pages worth of all the policies. We're happy to have those um, for the retreat too, just so we can get into the um, discussions around uh, boards governing themselves and what would that look like. And just as a, just um, as a plug, the people that we have coming to facilitate um, the work session, um, they work with boards, so they can tell us also best practices of how boards approach these same dilemmas that you're asking about. Okay, I see what you said. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Uh, Butler Washington? Yes, up on the board member district meetings, 
When it says board member will not receive assistance from CCPS staff to include the superintendent <laughs> district uh, meeting, um, couldn't that be simply if uh, the superintendent say if she wants to do it or not? It's up still up to her. She can say no, or she can say yes. So it's the same thing. So by saying this, if she wanted to be included into something or wanted to do something, you just extra out that she cannot be included. So let me get to the. So I can understand yeah, CCPS yeah. staff. Yeah. That's that, mm -hmm. I don't think none of us will ask that, but for the superintendent, she could simply say no. May I respond? So what? Let me make sure I'm looking at the same thing. What? What page is it? Ten. Ten. Yes. Oh, that's right. Right, so um, so in deference to the superintendent's time, I, th I think the thought was, and Ms. Morley, if I, if I got this wrong, tell me, when, when that language was put in there based on suggestions from, um, from the two committees that met, you have four districts and an at-large person, and if they had quarterly or even twice a year meetings in their districts and the superintendent was expected to be at all of them, that would be a lot of the superintendent's time. And so to make it easier for the superintendent by saying the superintendent's not going to come to these individual meetings, the course at town halls and things like that, then no one is, is feeling pressured or the superintendent's not feeling pressured to go to one district meeting versus another. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's why that was put in there. And again, even if, if you had two of these a year, um, so now you're talking 10 times that the superintendent has to come out and that's just a lot of her time. And Ms. Morley, if you could, if you have anything else to add? Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. that the, the key word I think that we discussed was the assistance piece, because of course that leads to time with the finding the venue, with the planning, with all of that, um, and not making it appear that we were tasking the superintendent or requiring her to attend. So the way that I read it, if the superintendent chooses to attend, but she'd be attending and not necessarily expected to you know, answer questions or actively participate because it would be the board member that would be hosting the town hall. Um, and the superintendent more or less would be like a, a, a guest, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's but fair. it's not, not an expectation that, you know, four districts at large, the superintendent I am never a guest in a room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> education. <laughs> She's like, I'm always a VIP. Yeah. Yeah. I am but never just, a guest. But just being considerate of the superintendent, that was my, my understanding. Was yeah. that yours, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Lucas? Yeah. No, I, I, I get that, but yeah. it's still up to the superintendent to say yes or no. I, I don't think she's going to come to everybody's uh, thing if she has something to do. So it's still up to her to say yes or no, but with this language, you're telling us not to even ask her. That's what this language says. Well, not to ask, well, not to receive not to ask to assist. To assist. But not necessarily to no. attend. So attendance assist. is something. But always invite her. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not expecting her to help with the planning. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. receive assistance from the staff to yeah. include this superintendent. Right, as, correct. Assistance right. from the staff. So we will never ask for assistance from the staff. Well, this will this will codify that. Yeah, Miss Smith. No, just wanted to echo what's already been said. I think this puts the superintendent, our one and only employee, in a precarious situation if we don't have firm language in terms of where she's expected to engage and we're not. Um, for instance, if she attends your event, Ms. Butler Washington, but yet she doesn't attend my event, or she attends Ms. Warren's event, but not Mr. Hancock's event, I think that puts her in a very interesting position in that it's not a balanced approach to being able to support families across the county in the different districts. Um, it just presents a, a real issue. And then when it comes down to the evaluation, I think it could be a, a biased review if again, she supported your event, but not my event. So I think across the board, if there is no expectation that she support or attend, well not support, but that she does not attend the events, I think that that's fair. Okay, well as long as it's not that we cannot ask, because it, it could be an event that she could 
she, she possibly want to come to. So still asking the question, can she attend? So as long as it don't violate that, that's what I'm saying. I can still ask her. So is that the understanding? I have a different understanding. Well, my understanding. That's what I did. I did too. No, right. And I think we need yeah. to clarify the language. Yeah, yeah. My expectation would be that we don't ask her to attend. That's why I asked. Um, and I think that's up for you know colleagues to support. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps they'll go your way. Perhaps they'll go in the way in which that was discussed. Um, but I think it's a matter of again not putting her in a situation where she could not be successful, and that she has to pick and choose where she goes, uh, because you asked. She can support yours, but not mine. Again, I, I think it puts her in a, a real but interesting I position. I have, I have a question. I, I, I think, I mean, I'm just listening. I'm thinking that for me, it's a matter of communicating with a colleague. Like if you're having something on um, May 5th and I'm decided to have something on May 5th. That's your birthday, isn't it? I know, but anyway, <laughs> right. You know, it's just a matter of communicating like, hey, you know, when you're having your event. I mean, that's just as simple for me. And then as far as um, holding it against her, you know, during her evaluation, that's, I, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, that's not something that I would do. I mean, I understand that it's four districts and, you know, it's a big county, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't really have any expectation, but I think an invite is okay. Um, but to, to say, hey, you have to be, you know, just have an expectation that she'll be there. It's like, if she comes, she comes. If she don't, she don't. I mean, that's just me. She's, a, she's our employee. We're, as a professional, you cannot show up for your job. You cannot not show up for your job. So if your employer has made a request that you attend something, you can't shirk that responsibility and just not attend. Again, I guess for me it's communication, even between me and that superintendent. You know? So I think, yeah, so I think, so it's a good discussion, and this will be a good topic for the retreat. Yeah, Mr. Hancock. Yeah. Just briefly, if I could. The only concern I have with um, if the superintendent attends certain individual district meetings is it can give the impression that it's it's a board position that it's that an individual board member is speaking on behalf of the board and only the chairman can do that um i think it would give that we run the risk of giving that impression that's my only concern with it and and even as a guest she's still going to be approached with a lot of questions i think so but I, I, I get it's it. It's just my thoughts. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I don't, if you're having a, I see it done in other counties, and Prince Charles County is huge, and they do it. Mm -hmm. So it don't seem like a big deal to them. So I'm saying he doesn't come to all. He comes to some. She comes to all. She doesn't come to all. That, that to me, is fine. If she doesn't come to mine, I'm not going to hold it against her. I, she can't make it because she got competing uh, activities she got to do. So I understand that. So I'm just saying asking her would be different than saying you cannot. And I don't want anyone, um, especially as I am as an elected official, telling me I cannot. That, 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 that doesn't work. Because when you're any other elected, they don't say you cannot talk to or ask him. It's up to the individual to say yes or no. And we all are adults and we understand that if she can't come to your event, or if she can't come to my event, I perfectly understand that. Mm -hmm. But extending the, op the, um, the, ex the, um, the, uh, By the invitation. The invitation is different for me. Yeah, it's for just me saying, too. you know, I'm gonna have these certain people here, and would you like to come? Yes, daughter, no daughter, okay, I keep moving. So asking a question to me doesn't seem a big thing. Chairman? Yep, except Ms. Smith. If I may, and I'll be brief. Um, perhaps a way to split the baby is if the board agrees to a certain number of district-wide events or sp district-specific events a year. So that way it's not um, too much of the superintendent's time to be able to support the event. So perhaps it's just three district-wide events a year and we rotate kind of whose district those events are going to be in, um, if that's interest for my colleagues to entertain. So just putting another option on the table for us to discuss, I presume, during the retreat. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think it's all, uh, all good conversation.
To her credit, the superintendent has not said a single word. <laughs> <laughs> Except that she's never a guest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, never a guest. <laughs> yeah. I always get questions. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we'll, I, again, you know, there's draft stamped all over this and uh, we'll have this ready for our retreat. Anything else on that? Okay. Next, Mr. Schwartz. Good, Good evening. evening. I'm going to uh, present again the uh, 2024 legislative position paper for the board. This was presented at a previous meeting. Uh, this is a document that the board adopts annually as a basis for taking positions in Annapolis on various bills, both through MABE and through PISAM, and with our legislators. It's not intended to be all-encompassing. It's not intended to cover every potential bill that may come up. Any bills that we think the board may want to take a position on, the board can certainly do that individually as, a, uh, as, they, as they are introduced. This is coming for adoption at the uh, next board meeting. We will have this adopted, hopefully, before the legislative breakfast at the end of, no at the end of November. Sorry. I was looking for something as you typed. Or as you spoke, I'm sorry, as I typed. Any questions or any comments on this? Mm. Yeah, Ms. Smith? Go ahead. Eh. No, I was just going to inquire about the <clears throat> right time to update the list of legislative proposals? Sure. Would that be here in this forum or would that be in a different forum? No, this is this is the time. If you'd like to bring something up, this is the time. Like I think we mentioned at the last meeting, if there's if there's something that the board wishes um, to have ready for the legislative breakfast, the sooner we get that discussion going, the better. Certainly. So well I'll take a moment to gather my thoughts, but I will yield to Ms. Okay. Surely. Yeah, I, I had a similar um, thought and question and um, have something I would like for the board to consider um, adding to this, these legislative proposals. Um, it's something that, um, you know, candidly, it, I think is, has been long overdue. I'd like us to consider an increase to both the uh, SMOB, I believe it's called a stipend that the SMOB receives, which is currently $1,000 a year and also to consider an increase for the board compensation. It's been about 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, since that has occurred. So I, my understanding is if the board is in agreement that we would request that the superintendent um, look into this for the next meeting. And, and if I yes. could just comment Please. without speaking to the yeah. merits of that. Uh, <laughs> we do not have to add that to the legislative position document. We can have that as a standalone bill that we would like to introduce in Annapolis. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If, if the board is interested in pursuing that, uh, we could certainly draft a, a proposed bill for the board to look at and then propose it to our legislators. Okay. The earlier, the better. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. And to be clear, um, for the, if a bill like that, if in fact it did pass, it, well, things are a little different now, but, but for the sake of argument, I'll say it wouldn't be effective until uh, 2026. Well, so with 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 an election next year, it could potentially, but I, I don't know that the board would want to have that position. But for the, when when the board was elected as a whole, it was always at, for the next election, correct? Typically, when there's an increase in salaries for any legis any uh, elected position, it doesn't take effect unless there's an intervening election. It would take effect after the following election. So if the board were to adopt it this year or for next year, it would take effect after the next elected board is, is chosen. Now, there is an elected position coming up next year, as Mr. Lucas is pointing out. And so uh, the legislation would have to address whether it would address just that one board member or that, wouldn't, that increase wouldn't kick in until the rest of the board is up for election. Okay. And for increases to the student member uh, compensation, uh, it could take effect next year because there is an intervening ch uh, choosing of that board member, that student board member. Okay. Okay. And that would be all right with me if, this, if the SMOB is able to get it first. I would be all right with that. So I, I only say that. Depending on how the legislation is drafted. Right. right. Assuming it yeah, passes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I only say that to, to, to note that, that, that the urgency 
for, for the board part isn't as critical as time wise as the urgency for the for the small part. Okay. Um, um, yeah, Miss Speller Washington. I'm gonna say you say that, but if legislator when they write it, in a, if they uh, so approve it, they could put in there affected whatever date they want to do right. Um, uh, boy, putting me on the spot for that. <laughs> um, it may be a constitutional issue. I think it may be a constitutional provision that in increases in compensation for elected members can't take effect unless there's an intervening election. Now, I say that without knowing for sure, so honestly, I have to, have to research that. But if there's nothing in the Constitution about that, yes, but however the legislation is drafted and passed, mm -hmm. that's what would be uh, in, mm -hmm. implemented. Yeah, I, I think it's whatever legislation says it is. It's not, I don't think it's a Constitution. It's, it's whatever they deem to sure. say it is. For the record, I would never vote for to give myself an increase while sitting in a position. <laughs> Let me just make that clear. For, for the record, <laughs> I, I have to say the same. Okay. Thank That's you. fair. Uh, yeah. uh, Ms. Kramer yes. and Ms. Smith. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. I mean, the commission did it. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Kramer. Oh, Ms. Smith was first. Yeah. Uh. No, I was just going to ask for clarification from Mr. Schwartz. You mentioned the standalone bill versus kind of putting it in the legislative issues that's been drafted. What's the pros and cons of not having it in both places? Uh, this document is intended to be a continuing position paper. This is our position paper uh, that we adopt year to year continuing. So we wouldn't want to put something in here continuing year to year to say we want to raise for the board because that would impl imply we'd want to raise consistently. Okay. Uh, but a standalone bill certainly could be voted on by the board individually uh, to propose a raise just this one particular time coming up. Okay, just wanted to know that clarification. Thank you. Ms. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. And I just wanted to say that um, I support what Ms. Morley has proposed for both the student member of the board increasing um, the stipend um, and for the board a compensation increase. As she noted, it's been about 10 years um, since the board has received um, an increase in compensation. And um, as we all have seen almost a year in, um, this, ro this role, this position um, entails a lot of work that um, the average person doesn't fully understand, I don't think, until mm -hmm. you actually take on the role. And, um, you know, to see that, that also, you know, we're taking care of our, um, obviously the school system priorities um, first, you know, and foremost, and, and making sure that our county is, um, you know, competitive when it comes to staffing and, um, you know, other salaries and things. Um, I just think that it shows, you mm -hmm. know, value and also places on um, the um, necessary weight that this role carries um, by acknowledging that it's been a significant amount of time um, since there's been an increase for the Charles County Board of Education. So I do support what Ms. Morley has suggested. Uh, a question, Mr. Schwartz. The the legislation that was passed that, that changed how the board was elected, were the salaries included as part of that? There was no change in the salary as part of that bill. It's the same section of the law, same uh, general area um, title of the law, but it's not, it was not changed in that bill. Okay, okay. So I bring that up because I, I think something else, and, and if they were related, this is why, why I asked the question, so I have a couple of thoughts. I think that the board should consider um, how how that bill, the bill that changed the way the board is elected, how that came about. Originally, there were, it was introduced there was going to be three at-large members and one board member from each district. Um, and then the members at large would serve initially a two-year term and then a subsequent four-year term. And that was purposeful to introduce stagger in the board, and that was part of the reasoning. Well, in all the, the, the gyrations of the bill, as often happens, it went to two board members from each district and one at-large, and the, but the two-year term stuck with the at-large position. Mm -hmm. So I think it would behoove the board to, um, to submit to our legislators that 
we introduce something that, that puts the stagger back into the Board of Education, which is what they wanted to do originally anyway. So that's why I ask if the salary was part of that and, and if, that, if that was the bill to look at or if we needed to do something separately. And again, kind of like the board salary, not necessarily an immediate thing. Um, and then the other thing that I'll bring up is um, if, maybe you don't know the answer, but if, if, if the charter government proposal, if that were to pass, we would no longer have commissioner districts and our elected positions are based on commissioner districts so no 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 that's incorrect wait excuse me miss but excuse me miss Butler washington so with that so i'm asking you um is would that have to be changed uh, i'm looking at a board member shaking her head no uh if if the commissioner districts were to be taken out of the law generally for the commissioners, then the Board of Education election bill would have to be addressed so, so that the districts would be Board of Education districts. So whether they take districts out of the law for commissioners or not would affect how the board is selected. And concerning the issue about uh, the staggering of the board members that you just raised, um, it is a separate uh, um, section of the law but it can be in the same bill if there were one bill introduced to address the Board of Education as a whole. So it can be in one bill, even though it's a separate section of the law. Okay. It's in the same subtitle of, of the education article. One bill. Now, Ms. Butler Washington, please. I want to correct that about the charter. They're, they won't be called commissioner, they will be called councilmen, and they will run in their districts. So they still will be districts. Well, I, it will be councilmen instead of, that's the only difference. I, they will still be district. They have to okay. run in that district. I, and I appreciate that. Okay. But the law that specifies how we are elected states we are elected by commissioner districts. And it would just change the council. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> just change. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. I think, I think the point I'm trying to make is that I, th I believe, and if you don't know the answer, I believe that if the charter <coughs> does pass, that there would have to be some sort of change to the legislation to reflect that. Mm -hmm. And that might be then an opportunity, if the board so chooses, in, in one fell swoop, to introduce all these things that we spoke about, if there's going to have to be a modification anyway. So that modification from commissioner districts to council member districts uh, can be done in various ways, but one way it can be done is if a bill pass passes in Annapolis to make Charles County a charter uh, county, they would go through the, all of the sections of the law t talking about commissioner districts and amend those to council districts. Uh, that can be in a bill addressing that charter government issue. It can be one particular bill that addresses throughout the education article, throughout all of the uh, annotated code. It can be one bill. Or it can be, as you're saying, a bill just for the Board of Education addressing that provision, in which case it could open up that whole section of the law for other changes that we might, might want as well. Okay. Got it. Ms. Morley. Oh. oh, sorry, Ms. Brother Washington. Okay. Sorry. Um, so if the charter passes, just information for the board, if it passes next year, it won't go in effect until 2026. So that's the difference. So um, I was gonna say the same thing as um, uh, board member um, Kramer said, that I do support it and um, for the same very reason, because if you look across the districts, uh, especially our neighboring, they get, they get there's a 16,000 a year. So they do the same thing we do. So I'm just pointing out the numbers that saying that, you know, big difference there. So that was my analogies for that. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Morley. Just for the benefit of the public who may not know, because candidly, I didn't know, um, and you do not run for this position because of the compensation. Let's be clear. You cannot make a living on it at all. <laughs> it, it's, it's $500 a month um, before taxes, which is paid quarterly, um, plus a, a humble transportation stipend. And being candid, it's not enough to cover gas. So typically, um, on any given week, 
just using myself as an example, it can vary from 20 hours, sometimes 30 hours a week, depending on meetings and preparation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when I did the math, it averages to about $5 an hour. So we're not talking about something that's going to break the budget. This is not going to be, you know, <laughs> humbly, even if we doubled everyone's salary here, we wouldn't even hit $100,000 extra a year, not, not even close to that. So I just want the public to understand we're not talking about a quarter million dollars or some excessive amount of money. But as has been raised, um, this is something that, um, you know, several of us do feel strongly about because one, it has not happened again in 10 years. And two, because the level of effort and work and commitment that we're putting into it, um, I just candidly believe that the board members can justify that because as you know, we are a visible and working board. We're very active in the community. So we're not just showing up just to these meetings and be like, oh, by the way, give us a raise. So um, to my original point, I would like to propose this for this current um, upcoming um, legislative breakfast. Now, it's up to obviously the delegation to vote up or down, to take it up or not take it up, because it's, it's not something that we can vote on for ourselves other than to present it to them. So that was my other point. Thank you. So what I think you started, but, but we got in discussion. So what's the action? So the action is just not we need to pay increase. I, I think I heard talk about asking the superintendent so what's, um, what's, yes. what's the action? Yes, that, that, that was the request, to ask the superintendent to do a presentation, preferably at the next meeting, since we are coming up against the uh, legislative um, breakfast in November, just to compa for comparison purposes of uh, compensation mm -hmm. of similarly situated districts. Understanding okay. it won't necessarily be a perfect fit, but just as a starting point. Okay, just want to make sure we got that yeah. documented. Mr. Hancock. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I just want to know if the board would be in agreement with an idea that I have, being is it something that relates to something we're going through now? Um, on the same topic as the same bill that restructured the Board of Education, um, it wouldn't help us now, but I, I would like in the future, if, if the board agrees, if we could talk to our um, delegates and our representatives about it if there's ever a vacancy again on the board that it be filled through a special election I would like to personally see that change in law so would that be addressed directly to the bill that the bill that was passed Correct. It, it could be and I will uh, say I'm not uh, familiar with and please correct me if I'm wrong, if you know any different, I'm not familiar with any school system that has special elections to fill vacancies. Vacancies are generally filled either by the Board of Education directly, which is only a couple of counties in the state that does, does it that way, uh, or the governor or the county government that uh, does it, either the county executive or the county commissioners. So that's the typical way to do it. I'm not aware of a special election which can be time consuming and costly uh, in a sense. Uh, but the idea of having another a way of selecting or filling the vacancy is certainly up for uh, something the board can consider, including a special election if that's what the board wants to propose. Well, I think what I would say is that at our, at our next meeting, um, it seems like all things are, are focused around the board. That, that's, we, we've talked about them a little bit, but if anyone has anything, um, more specific than we can discuss that at the next at the meeting next month yeah yeah Mr. Chairman. how are we proceeding then are we taking these individually is the board voting these up and down to support are we just going to address all of them at the next meeting we can we can address them individually at the next meeting or and then and yeah because typically we ask if there's board support proceeding that's why I asked well I mean sorry maybe what I said didn't come out correctly we're gonna have our next meeting someone someone could come to the next meeting and say I would like to do this because now they've, they've thought about something completely different at the next meeting no but as it relates to the suggestions that we heard today, today. yeah okay so the the issues today then are the stipend for the uh the for this for the smob mm -hmm. 
and propose. So, so the slapping for the smile, is everybody good with that? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. And then for salary increase for, um, for Board of Education members. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Who, who's, who's a yes for that? One, two, three, four, five, so that's six. Okay, so that's a go. So um, to Mr. Hancock's statement, so again, it doesn't preclude Mr. Hancock from talking about it at the next meeting. We're not, he can, he can gather information and bring whatever he likes, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but it, that doesn't need a, a, an up or down from uh, the majority of the board. Um, there's another one yeah. in my notes. So one of the things that I was thinking that might be helpful for the board and I heard is for the two items that we just discussed, um, we will be ready to present potentially in November a comparison of similarly situated districts and across the state, what that looks like, mm -hmm. as well as potentially draft what a possible language could look like for the board to have something. But um, I heard also potentially draft something regarding the staggering of board members and the length of term of the chair. You mentioned the two-year cycle and, and that piece. So I, was, I also had a, hmm, a note true. at which I'd like to see if there's a... Yeah, so that's... That's that, a third one that I have. Yes, yeah, so that's a fair point. Mm -hmm. If um, there's an interest in that, then we can also bring that back. Yeah, so how does the board feel about, about the original intent of the, of the legislation to stagger terms? No. How it is now. No. Could you clarify what you mean by staggered terms? Because yeah. currently we have staggered terms. Yeah. So at large. Yes. And then at large position. versus okay. well, district elected members. I think I was clear enough, but if I can see mm, the question. Question. when the bill was originally introduced, there was only going to be a seven member board. And so ha the board was half staggered. As the legislation was changed and it went to a nine member board, the initial two-year term only stuck with the at-large member. So the board's not staggered in the, in the original intent that, was, that the legislation was brought forth. And so what I'm saying is, you know, honor what the legislation was, was originally intended to do and stagger the board. I mean, that's, I don't know how it can be more clear. I mean, perhaps. Yeah. Um, just to dig a bit deeper, when you say to stagger the board, heard what you said. Yeah. Are you essentially saying that, for instance, by district, since we're elected by twos, that you would recommend that each district elected member time be staggered? So that you're not electing off cycle. Four, Is that what you mean, or are you saying like I, I, I think need additional uh, information for the proposal? To I think uh, I, th I think that would be something we have to talk about um, on on the best way to do that. Because what I'm what I'm hearing, if I could um, yeah. finish, is you basically want to go back to that original legislation. Correct. Correct. And what is the benefit in doing that? So the benefit is one. That's what the original legislation, how it was written. Okay. But to have a staggered board, you don't you, you run the risk of potentially having you know nine new people. Um, to, to do that for any elected body is is just you you lose kind of corporate knowledge and it just it provides more fluidity through the election process when new people come on can you can you repeat that I'm sorry so it just if you 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 run the risk of having an entire um, new elected body come on which can depending uh, can offer some challenges in trying to since everybody is new learning everything and so having a staggered board and by the way the board used to be staggered mm -hmm. till about 20 years ago um, and just offering that stagger it would just um, give a little better insurance that you have people on the board that have a little experience combined with people that um, that are new via the election process. Okay. Yeah. So, Miss Butler Washington and then Miss Morley. So, when you said stagger, so that'll be 
each district will have one person. No, I, no, 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 not, not changing that. Not changing that. So you're no. adding additional. No. no. There's, there's still be, there's still be nine people on the board. There's still be nine people on the board. If, if, if. I'm sorry, 10, including the students board member, yes. Still if, be. Uh, two people, if, okay, it's two in the district, that's eight right there. And then you large, and then the student. So what are extra two people coming from that's running from member at large? I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> In the original bill, the original bill had three at-large members and one person from each district. Th that's what I just said. That's what the original. That's right, what. Right, right, right. So, so that's what I'm saying. So I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we change the number of board members. All I'm suggesting is is that you stagger the elections. No, no, no. I got. I got that. I'm saying that the way you're saying it, it won't be two people from each district. Right, if you want. Because of the original way it was before. That's all I was saying. If I I did not say that, I'm sorry if you took it that way. No, there there would still be two people from each district. There would still be two people from each district. So and three law three. No, two people from each district and one person at large. Nothing would change about the number of people. But in the next election, you'd need to figure out a process to where to where um, certain people are are staggered, and that's. Yeah, I think the fact that we as a board aren't clear or in agreement on that, what this would look like is probably an indication that we shouldn't proceed. Um, I think if, if the legislature wants to take that up, then certainly, or if you want to draft something, Mr. Lucas, for us to consider, but this is not something I can support. I we don't even have agreement on what that would look like. Okay. I, I will present something. It's, it's pretty simple. One that the next time that there's an election, one person from each district would serve a two-year term, and then after that, serve a subsequent four-year term. But that's what Ms. Butler Washington was just saying. She was saying one person from each district would be elected at a time. That's what she just said. So that's why I said, no, I don't vote for so that. Are you not, proposing not, that? Not only, not, not initially. Yeah. yeah, okay. I'll, I'll draft it up. Yeah. I'll draft it up. And then I do have one more bullet. Just for clarification, um, just for follow-ups, um, is we had a little bit of a conversation about the possible changes um, to county government regarding a charter government, and there is Miss um, Butler Washington mentioned that there wouldn't be any changes, but does the board want us to confirm the what we talked about the implications of? language that would need to be fully changed throughout to um, ensure that Board of Education ma members are not tied to district, uh, commissioner districts. So I, I think it would behoove us as a board just to, to write something we can present to the, the, the commissioners or to the it won't be tr commissioner, charter to board, <laughs> but um, to clarify not just that but but any any concerns that we may have as as a board regarding how um, the Board of Education um, should or should not be affected and and to be clear I haven't seen anything that that indicates that it, but Ms. Butler Washington um, I will send it to Dr. Navarro it's against the law for this Board of Education to be in the Charter the reason Prince George County is in theirs, the legislators voted for them to be on there. Not that the charter board did it, because it's against the law. They went against the law to have that done. Charles County already reached out, delegate and senator already reached out and said, that would never be, so don't ask. And we was never going to ask. So there is no need to send a letter because we cannot do it per law. And so, I will send Dr. Navarro the language that says it. Mako stated it when he was at our last board meeting. And before that, Frederick County Executive stated it. So I will send the language so it will all be verified that we cannot put the school board in there. Okay, so I will, I will look to the board for any comment, Ms. Smith. Just a clarifying question. I want to make sure I'm squaring sort of, you know, what Ms. Butler Washington is saying, what Mr. Schwartz has said in terms of who has potential domain to appoint a member to this board in the event that there is a vacancy. I thought I heard you say 
that it's the governor, got that, check that box, but there's also a local level in which the commissioners could appoint a member to this board. So if that's currently a option, just thinking about if we were to move to charter, would the council then have that same authority to appoint a member to this board? The commissioners do not have the option to appoint to this board. Look at Mr. Schwartz. Not in, not in Charles County. Not they in don't. Charles County, okay. okay. So uh, around the state, there are various ways to fill, fill vacancies. We have the authority to fill our own vacancy in Charles County. I believe Montgomery County has that same authority. Other counties, either the governor fills the vacancy or the county executive fills the vacancy or the county commissioners fill the vacancy. There may be uh, ones where the county council does it as well. So those just generally either the county government in some form or the governor fills the vacancy. Okay, thank you. So Ms. Butler Washington, what I hear you saying is that there's no need for a letter from this body requesting that our business remain our business because currently the delegates aren't interested in creating any legislative path where the county executive or the charter council, whatever they're called, they, they would be, the council would take that over. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, if I could comment to what you just said. Yes. Please. You said there's no need because the legislation doesn't intend on submitting anything. So and that's so so that's this legislation. <laughs> um, this is the only comment that I would make to that. Miss mm -hmm. Morley. I was going to say something similar that you can't ever plan for the people that are currently in office. You always have to be looking ahead. And personally, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So to Miss Butler Washington's point, if she has something in writing right now, maybe that could be our starting point. Um, but my preference is always going to be for us to have our own position in writing. Okay, Ms. Kramer. I was just going to piggyback off of Ms. Morley. So I also hear what um, Ms. Butler Washington is saying, but same, I would like to see something in writing. And I've um, seen some discussions that indicate that while the superintendent can't be pulled under the charter, that a vacancy could be filled by the council if it were to be written that way. So we just want to make sure 110 percent that that is not included. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it wouldn't hurt to just have our position known, even if that's, you know, not on the table, um, just just to be clear. So no one says, well, you didn't tell us or we didn't know or we thought this would be OK or anything like that. that that's just my personal feelings about it. Um, I would just like to see something in writing and then I still don't think it's a bad idea that as a board we take a position publicly yeah. mm -hmm. um, just to, to make that known because I personally would want any um, responsibility of um, appointing a vacancy to remain with the Board of Education locally. So um, not with the county government or, or the state level and that would be my personal opinion. So. All right. Yeah, I would support that. You're good. Well. Are we good with that? I just want to say one thing before just, we good with that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do know y'all know I'm on the board, right? <laughs> so I have the board best interest at heart. Oh, yeah. So it's we important. went through this thing, and I think it was some misinformation came from a commissioner that got everybody bothered, but he was shot down and it was wrong. I can assure you. We, this board, no one, it's, it's against the law. And I'm going to send you, I'm, when I get home, I'm going to send you that law so you can send it to everybody. It's against the law for the uh, school board to be into a charter because they have no jurisdiction over the education. None, so ever. Prince George County legislators, they went before the body and they uh, voted against it. Our legislators are not interested in that. And I know you're saying that maybe uh, fathers, but I don't think that no legislator will ever do that to their constituents because we are elected officials. That, that's my only thing about it. So I, I am good. I, re I receive your letters. I got you. I'm fine with it. I'm just saying that Charles County would never do it. Thank you. So, Trust but verify. Yes. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Very, very good point. So, for for making a letter, drafting, drafting, yes. drafting, yes. drafting a position to support. Yes. Yes. Good. One, two. Okay, that works. All right. Anything else? 
Not yet. <laughs> you're good. You're good. No. Well, unless you're unless you're doing this next thing. I'm not. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not. Okay. So uh, next, uh, we have a couple of action items. Uh, the first, uh, we saw this at our last board meeting. It's a change to policy 5157.7. Uh, the search, elementary and secondary welfare, search of students. And so uh, at the last meeting, uh, we were provided this. Uh, the changes to the policies are in capital letters. Uh, it adds a couple of definitions and it also in, in adds the youth engagement advocate. Um, so at this point, the chair will entertain a motion to approve. A question. Can you hold your question? Yeah. Until we, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Now, any discussion? Ms. Perkins. Okay. So my only question is, as far as it goes with the parents, it says that they don't have to be, they don't have to approve of it, but if they want to be there, like if you were to call a parent and say, hey, we have reasonable reason to search your child, like do they have the option if they want to be there or not? Or is it just, I'm going to search your child and I'm letting you know, but we don't need your approval? So I'm going to turn to superintendent for that. Sure. So in the best possible scenario, we have to, at the end of the day, inform a parent if the search was done for their child. Um, depending on the situation, we may not be able to inform the parent uh, before the search is done. Uh, okay. We also, in some cases, may be able to inform the parent, and if the parent is able to come, uh, within a reasonable time frame, we would be able to accommodate that, but we can't guarantee it in every single situation. Okay, that was my only question. Okay. Any other discussion, Ms. Butler Washington? A youth engagement advocate and a principal. Understand why the principal can do it. And a youth, you want these th these people to engage with the. Um, with the students. You want them to be able to believe in them, and at the same time, you want them, if they do something, you want these same group of people to search them. Do you think you're gonna get any buy-ins from the students by doing that? My thing of it is, the youth engagement uh, advocacy, how, how many hours did they get, you said, of training? You're asking how many hours they receive in training for what purpose? What kind for of training? For searching and, and, and doing this particular job they're supposed to be doing? Youth engagement advocates, uh, as they were hired, went through an extensive training with uh, Jason Stoddard's office. Uh, they also received search and seizure training, the exact same training that our principals, administrators receive. Um, and that training is, uh, was done with them earlier this school year, before the school year started, actually. And so they, whatever they say, whatever they thought they could, if they think of something and they want to search them, the reason of doubt is what y'all call it. The reason of doubt, they can search the student. Well, they can base, uh, base their search on a reasonable belief that the student has something the student shouldn't have on them. It's the same authority that a teacher, that a uh, principal or, or assistant principal has, and it's an authority that's stated in state statute. And the SROs can't do this? The SROs are sworn police officers. They have a different standard. They're not our employees. And, and, and we don't want, um, what, when, when children are in our buildings, we are their legal guardian. And there are many times where we will proceed before we involve an SRO for many different reasons. Our procedures, and I wish Ms. Butler Washington, frankly, that you could have made the training that Eric did because we also train when necessary when we do field trips. Uh, we have teachers in charge of field trips and we have to train them in case there's a need to do a search when they're not in the building. 
and frankly, our definition, and I know that you and I disagree on this, and I understand your point uh, very well, but the reality is the relationship that you build with a young person, um, you know, it, it depends the, the strength of the relationship when you encounter difficult times with the young person. And our principals still have relationships with students many years later, <coughs> even after they have had to impose discipline, and some of them are very ser serious discipline consequences for mistakes that young people make. Mm -hmm. And so I will always say that as much as possible, I rather our administrators who are trained to look at this work differently interject first and then we can involve the police, but the police have a different set of rules. And that is a very important distinction as well. But I, I still look at a security guard has that same thing, and this person has not even been trained to be a security guard. And, and, and you want them to be able to search the students, and what, they got high school diplomas? The, the, the people that's been hired to do this? No, so we have, uh, we have a wider range of individuals. Some of them have been classroom teachers for many years. Uh, some of them have long-standing careers outside of education and in education. So there's a wide variety of individuals um, that we carefully, and the principals um, chose a careful set of individuals because of their current relatedness to students. Yeah. Ms. Perkins. Are you, are you, wait, were you finished? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, coming from a student perspective, I believe that like it could honestly be beneficial because there are teachers in the building that make connection with students. So if these student advocacy, um, if they make like an impact on the students, if they interact with them, if they build relationships, it could be beneficial because then it's like, okay, we trust you. We're more likely to tell you the truth. We're more likely to you know, be more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like compatible or whatever, or like comply with what's going on yeah. rather than it being like an administrator or somebody else or even having to get an SRO involved because that could intimidate students. Because, you know, not all SROs are like friendly or, you know, it could just be intimidating for some people. So I think if that connection is built, because there are teachers that have connections with students who aren't even their students, that we trust more than we would trust an SRO. Mm. Right. Thank you. Ms. Morley. Yeah, I'll reiterate my original point when we first discussed this. I completely understand why people would have concerns around this because for many people when you think search you think criminal law you think under arrest you think police officer that's not what this is intended to be and looking at the job description this is a portion of what the youth engagement advocate would do do i wish we didn't need this position i do i can't just be very candid with you i wish we weren't at this place but we also have to address that there has been an increase um, and there are ongoing issues in, in uh, many of our schools. And hopefully this person could be an intermediary to Ms. Perkins' point, because looking at the other things that they'd be doing, they're also gonna be helping with bus duty. They're gonna be helping with you know, dismissals. They're gonna be working on mediations. They're, they're a liaison with the fire department and emergency personnel, you know, uh, physical security assessments. Like This is a small portion of what they would do. And it's more along the lines of, as I understand it, you can correct me, Mr. Schwartz, if the, to the reasonable belief point, it's not I'm going looking for something. I have to have a solid, um, articulable, <laughs> I mean, above a reasonable articulable suspicion for those in the law, but something, um, and we attended, several of us, your training that, uh, for the teachers, it's something that would almost be along the lines of what would stand up in court. It's not just I don't like you, I'm targeting you. There has to be some real solid belief. Now with that said, if we do subsequently hear that this is not as working as intended, I would not have any problem with saying, well, we need to revisit this. Mm -hmm. So I just want to go on the record as saying that as well. I have a quick question. <coughs> quick question. Warren, oh. and then Mr. Hancock, and then um, back to. How many of these youth advocates, for me it's the, the, the um, to, to miss um, the vice chair's point, I like the other side of this. I think the, the um, you know, all the things that they're going to do to help the kids, um, I guess, be more engaged in school. I think for me, it's just the title is misleading, the, the youth engagement advocate. That doesn't sound like searching and all that, even though that's a small portion of the uh, position. My question is how many, I know we probably talked about this already, but just to refresh my memory, how many youth advocate 
or engagement advocates are going to be in a school or school? We have um, seven. We started this year with seven, one in each high school. Okay. And so, for instance, if there's an incident, how, like I'm just trying to figure out as far as building relationships, to your point, you're exactly right. Um, they can't build relationships with all the kids. And you know what I mean? That's a lot of students to, for, for one person to build relationships with. So what, at one, what point would that youth advocate or youth engagement advocate be called in to, you know, I guess search a kid or whatever? Would it be a kid that they already formed a relationship with or it's just, you know so, what I'm saying? When, when would they be tagged yeah. in to so, the process? So here's how schools run in, in that way, I think. You know, one, this is one position of many. Um, the reality is that young people are going to gravitate to certain adults, and we mm -hmm. hope that every young person has an adult they gravitate to. Mm -hmm. The reality in schools, as you know, Ms. Warren, is that we don't get to play the good cop or bad cop. We have to have a strong relationships that even if you make a mistake, and it could be a bad mistake, mm -hmm. we are still going to be there to, to deal with the mistake work you through it, and then have you come back su successfully from it. That's when you know there's a relationship established. Mm -hmm. um, I think about our principals, like Principal Lou at Steedham, mm -hmm. the relationship that he and his staff have to build with those students so that they trust enough to say, this is for your best interest. Let me guide you. Mm -hmm. This position was meant to be an additive adult in the school that would be working with the student services team of a high school, which includes the counselor, the PPW, the psychologist, the assistant principals, the principals, people who sit around the table and talk about who have the teachers queued up to us that is not having an easy time or something's not right, who do we need to talk through? Or who have, um, who do we need to engage because we don't see them as engaged in school as, as they need to. It's not always just the kids who have a fight and then we need to figure out what happened there and follow it through. Because remember, when, when, when kids get into a fight, there's a whole follow-up that happens after mm -hmm. the kids even come back and the punishment and everything. It's just following up and saying, hey, check in with Miss Navarro after you get off the bus every day to just do a quick check-in. That's what a lot of people did. So the youth engagement position was meant to be an additional position to help the administration, to help the schools um, be able to add more people to connect with young people. We had to train them on a whole bunch of things that are important for them to know because as you know, you walk into a school, you need to know your role and who plays which role and what other role. Our goal is that this individual is not just a what traditionally has been a security um, person, but it's actually more than that, mm -hmm. that it's a person that gets trained, and our hope is, and Dr. Jones mentioned this previously, that's um, somebody who, get, who gets trained on peer mediation through our student services department. And maybe it's one of the leads, there's a couple of leads, sometimes it's a teacher lead, the counseling department lead, and maybe the, um, the youth engagement advocate who will lead our peer mediation programs. Um, we want to have peer mediation at all of our secondary schools. Some of our schools have already started doing peer mediation programs, and so this would be yet another person who could lead that work. But at the same time, if there's an incident and there's a, there is um, reasonable suspicion that a student has something that could affect the safety of themselves or of the building, that that individual would also be able to handle that in what we call a school level search. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to give that tool, it's not a tool that they have to use often, but if they needed to use it in a specific consequence, especially when they're dealing with students who, you know, have made a mistake, potentially could make a mistake, that they're able to uh, go through that process, hence why we train them uh, and we requested the policy to include them, and the board just has to make a decision if this is a yay or nay at this point, um, so that they would have that resource if they needed it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Tutor essay was next, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I actually spoke to a friend of mine who is a school resource officer at a school here in our county, just to see what his thoughts were on this. He thinks it's a great idea. Um, in his words, ideally, he wants to be in the school to protect the children and the staff of the school from people outside of the school. And he doesn't want to get into day-to-day -day 
altercations and disciplinary issues because then those students constantly see him as the guy that's coming to be involved in every dis disciplinary issue. And obviously that is a perfect world where he would strictly be there to protect the students from the outside world. And there's a lot of crazies out there in the outside world. Um, so he sees this as something that uh, not only would help him in a process such as what we're talking about, but to maybe prevent that process from ever happening in the first place. So I know we're, we're focused on giving the authority to do this, um, but I think there's more to this position than just that. And I think the goal would be to limit the amount of searches and limit the amount of altercations and limit the amount of times that we have to get a, get a school resource officer involved. I know this particular issue sticks out um, because we have to give them the authority to do that, um, but it's just something, hopefully it's not used often, um, but if it needs to be used, um, you know, we have to uh, we have to keep our schools safe. And sometimes you, you just need a, a highly trained individual that can that can think quick enough to say, hey, I need to we need to check you out and see what you have. Um, but um, I just wanted to bring that up. I know we're focused solely on this issue, but I think the position um, is, is a good asset to our system. Thanks. Ms. Perkins. Yeah. Ms. Kramer, did you want to go? OK. Um, I wanted to say two things. One, also realizing that like once those connections are built, that they have the our best interests at heart. They're there for a purpose. They have our best interests. And no, it's not solely for searching, but that's a part of the job. But at the end of the day, it's to benefit us. And back to what Ms. Warren said, even if, yeah, so no, they can't build relationships with all the students, but even if that means like there's teachers or whatever, or admin, even administrators that just talk to students as they're going through the hallway, saying hi, you know, and kind of like just having small conversations with them. And then those students tend to talk to them when they see them in the hallway, they tend to have conversations with them. So then it's like a kind of a relationship built. Now it might not be close as if you're a teacher and you know you have that student and you develop a relationship with them over time but it's still some type of relationship where you can trust that adult in order so if it was in a situation where they needed to be searched or something was going on they would go to them or they would be okay with them doing it rather than an SRO or an administrator that they may not like or something as that nature of that person. Okay. Ms. Kramer and then Ms. Smith. So thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, and I, I, I do want to say first that I, um, we've had a lot of extensive conversation about this since it came up um, the first time. I think this is probably our like third or fourth meeting um, where we've discussed it. And I do just want to acknowledge and um, say that I appreciate the added language that the superintendent has brought forward, because um, this is not the original policy that we looked at. Mm -hmm. And um, just appreciate, you know, her acknowledging some of the concerns because like many of my colleagues, you know, I'm a parent of a child that currently attends school here in Charles County. And so, you know, this policy would affect my own child, um, like many of us. And so we do share concerns, you know, that some parents have expressed. Um, and so just appreciate the superintendent for acknowledging that um, and coming back with some added language to kind of um, help explain a little bit further about um, the reasonable belief definition and um, adding the piece about um, parental notification when when possible. Um, but to Ms. Morley's point, I, I wish we weren't here either, but we are. And, um, you know, I think that um, if we can provide some added support to our students um, and, you know, alleviate some of the pressure off of our administrators. Um, I think if this role would do what it's designed to do, then that would be a positive thing for our schools. Um, and I appreciate the student board member's perspective as a student, and I think that she made a very good point that if they build these relationships, you know, the students will come to them. So they will say, hey, yeah, you don't have to search me. I'll tell you. I have this item, you know, or they will confide in the youth engagement advocate. And I think that, not speaking for the superintendent, but I think that's how it comes across to me as was the intent um, for the role. And I know to Mr. Hancock's point, you know, everyone's zoning in on the search piece. Um, but the reality is that this has been going on, um, you know, by administration and of course the teachers that um, were trained, which also shout out to Mr. Schwartz, appreciate that training because that was very, informative for me to understand 
Um, and, and Mr. Schwartz made no, he meant no words. He said, if, if you don't think this will hold up, it's not worth it. Don't do it. You know, if you're questioning it, don't do it. Um, so there, these, these individuals are not being trained, nor are the teachers, to go out and just search every student whenever you have some inkling. Um, so I just want the public to know that, um, that several of us did attend the training. So we saw um, the actual language and, and you know, received the same instruction um, that, that these um, youth engagement officers, or advocates rather, and the um, teachers that are acting in, you know, on a field trip, I guess, instead of the principals that they receive. So that was really enlightening um, for me. And so I just appreciate the, you know, the discussion. I think it's important that we clarify these things um, and that we provide clarification when there are questions or concerns. Um, but just, you know, wanted to point those things out for the public. Okay. Ms. Smith. And I'll be super brief, um, which is not my natural setting, but I'll work to be brief. Um, definitely want to echo exactly what my colleagues have already shared, um, especially that many of us do have kind of proverbial skin in the game. Many of us are parents. Um, <clears throat> many of us, our children will be directly impacted by this policy in the event that they fit into the criteria that's been established um, if they do make some of these mistakes. So, you know, we are voting on policies that will immediately affect our very own children um, should these things sort of happen to them or they kind of fall into these circumstances. Um, just definitely want to point out something the superintendent said in terms of school systems being the de facto guardian for children that enter their buildings um, from in the event that your child is injured or hurt and needing to get immediate medical attention. Um, especially with the search and seizure, and definitely wanting to ensure that all children are safe, both mine, my kids' peers, every child in our school system. Also wanting to note that while we are, we have emerged from the pandemic, recognizing that many of our students lost a year and a half, almost two years of social engagement, that they're still working to get back. Um, our kids are more connected and global citizens at their very young age than we were when we were growing up. So they are watching war take place presently. They are watching um, things that are happening both in our nation as well as across the, the world and wanting to make sure that they have the proper mental health supports to be able to deal with some of those things if they're not getting supports at home. And so wanting to ensure that there are policies in place that in the event that they do make a mistake, there are people there to help them that are not law enforcement initially. Um, so which is why I'm definitely in support of this with the amended language, but just wanting to note that for the, the public, there are a variety of factors that we know are playing out in our high schools, but a very select few, but that are playing out and just making sure they have the supports they need from an adult that's in a position to offer that support that is not the SRO. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Yeah. Ms. Perkins. Okay, two more things. Um, one, back to what Ms. Creamer said, as in, I don't believe that, like, it's sad that we have to do this and that we are here, but also what she said is the support from them and then also being able to confide in them because I've seen it actually happen this year like firsthand we got a new administrator at our school and yeah so like when there's kids in the hallway or whatever she says something to them like okay what are you guys doing in the hallway whatever but she's kind of like one of those cool administrators that even though she's new and she hasn't been there long people confide in her like Every day at lunch, there's the same couple of people or whatever that talk to her every day at lunch, you know, that she's, they're telling them like, you know, what's going on, you know, and everything like that. So they have that, that trust every time like she sees them, you know, they speak. So they have that trust and that connection to where they feel safe around her or okay with confiding in them. And then that's also what some students just need, even if they don't have that relationship, you may speak to them sometimes in the hallway and you might see them in the hallway and they look down and it's like, okay, like, you know, what's going on? You look down today or whatever and they will confide in you because sometimes there's a deeper issue than what they're letting on or what they're letting off. So sometimes they just need somebody to talk to and that will listen so they could get that deeper issue out and then you could get to the root of what's really going on or why they're acting the way that they're acting. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Ward. Yes, I love hearing from the students' perspective, so that's that's nice. Um, what else are were they trained on? Um, you, you said the the, the uh, security and because you're speaking to your what you just said, mm -hmm. being able to identify walking through the halls and seeing that a kid is down, um, and being sensitive enough to that um, and discerning enough to pick that up. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people you can't be trained to to have discernment, but you know, just that part of it, you know, are these, uh, and I'm sure we talked about this already, but 
um, what else are they being trained on to, you know, be able to uh, kind of uh, identify red flags or just, you know, some things that kids may be going through so, or so, just or not, you know? Yeah, sure. So um, there are, and I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but there were many, many hours of different trainings that they received. Um, one of them is um, training in de-escalation, okay. which is a, a big one because that's sort of what you're getting at, mm -hmm. being able to recognize when students are having some, some troubles that are leading them down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some trainings with uh, PBIS. Okay. Um, and some of the, the, the tactics there, some of the restorative practices trainings that they've had in addition to the, of course, the search and seizure um, uh, training that they've had. And then other trainings that were done not um, directly by Mr. Stoddard, but folks from the um, Maryland Center for Safety and Security uh, mm -hmm. came and did some training with them as well. So a number of hours, I might have to go back and tell you exactly what they are, but lots of different different trainings. Okay, yeah, just a nice little refresher there. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Morley. Um, if I could quickly, um, to Ms. Warren's point, is it the Maryland Center for School Safety, the SRO SSE training? Yes. Okay, yes. I, I had it. Um, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, two hours. Crisis intervention, right. three hours. Data capture, one hour. Dangers of devices, two hours. Normative adolescent behaviors, three hours. School, uh, Safe Schools Maryland, one hour. Understanding intellectual devent devent uh, developmental disabilities, four hours, I'm getting tired. <laughs> um, De-escalation training, four hours. Disability and, uh, and diversity awareness, four hours. Implicit bias, um, four hours, which was expanded from two hours. Restorative approaches in schools, what, why, how, eight hours. So just to answer your question this morning. Thank you, Ms. Morley. Okay. Uh, no problem. Any, I had that from earlier. <laughs> any other discussion? Ms. Perkins? One thing. Um, back to the de-escalating thing. I've also seen that happen, too. So back to that um, specific administrator, there are two separate students that both confide in her, that both are kind of like, you know, close to her, that they talk to her, and they kind of have an issue with each other. But because she's cool with both of them so they're both telling them their side of the story so then she's de-escalating the situation without both of them being there so then it doesn't go into something further so not every situation will be like that but just for an example of de-escalating like she's making sure that okay well don't do this and you know talking to them so they don't escalate to something else yeah all right and that's it. Okay. Healthy discussion. So we had a motion and a second. Correct. It was Mr. Hancock and Ms. Smith. Smith. Okay. So um, all those in favor of 5157.7 as presented here, please signify by raising your hand. It's Ms. Warren, Ms. Thomas, Ms. Smith, Ms. Creamer, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Morley, myself, and Ms. Perkins. All those opposed? Ms. Butler Washington, thank you. Motion passes. Okay, on to the next thing in the agenda, which uh, we saw this at the last meeting as well. And thank you again for Ms. Creamer and for the staff in editing this. This is a um, uh, proposed resolution for Native American Alaska Native Heritage Month. Motion to approve. So made by Mr. Hancock, seconded. We'll have Ms. Morley this time. Um, any discussion on this? All right. Oh, yeah. I was give a comment. Yes. Ms. Kramer. Yes, I'm going to discuss my own resolution. Yes. No, I just, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but I was just going to take this time. Um, I just wanted to thank my colleagues for allowing me the opportunity to draft this resolution um, and to come before you for its consideration. I think. Um, Adopting this resolution really goes a long way um, and is long overdue, in my opinion, um, in terms of acknowledging and recognizing the rich and diverse cultures that exist here in Charles County, um, and specifically recognizing our indigenous populations demonstrates that the board um, in Charles County Public Schools values and appreciates the contributions um, of our native populations. So just wanted to thank you all for that. All right. Thanks, Ms. Kramer. Yeah, Ms. Dr. Navarro. Um, so I just wanted to also make a comment, if it's okay from the board, if this resolution passes, um, it takes effect November 1st through November 30th. 
And I was wondering, um, because we will come together and meet again November 15th, and that will be 15 days in, if the board would allow us to, if it passes, to print it out, have it signed by both of us, and then um, ask Ms. Kramer um, to be able to recognize it to one of our staff members that will come and get it, and we could just do a picture to memorialize if it passes through before sure. November 1st. Oh, before November 1st. Yes, the oh. board would be okay with having Okay. And we can certainly the bring board member that. We could certainly yeah. still do it publicly in November t as well. You, you could. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. I'm okay with whatever okay. the chair decides and the board decides. So. Okay. All right. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. All right, we have come to the end. Um, is there anything else the board needs to bring up or discuss? All right. Okay. Miss <laughs> Thomas, Miss <laughs> Thomas is seconded. Did we, did we say we're going to be talking afterwards? I. I yes. <laughs> okay, I, I, I ask if there is anything to do. And I paused at great length. So I think she looked away for a second and was getting ready to raise her hand. Yeah. So would you we can how do we uh, get rid of the motion of the on the floor, Mr. Schwartz? Oh, there was a second. Yeah, we can vote it down. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this will be a first, right? So, all, <laughs> all, all, those, all those in favor of adjourning, please raise your hand. All right. So, that is. Uh, okay. So, that is. What, did you put your hand up? Okay. Miss Thomas. Okay. All, all those opposed. All those opposed. Okay. Okay. I'm 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 just here. Well, well, I move to go to close uh, executive meeting. That's what we needed to hear. Okay, Mr. Schwartz, you want to come up? But then we have to read it first, and then. No. We just. We need a motion for the board to meet in executive session as permitted by the Maryland Open Meetings Act Section 3-305 and 3-103 of the general provisions article to discuss administrative function matters specifically concerning an appointment by the board. So moved. Second. It's made by Ms. Smith and seconded by Ms. Morley. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay, Ms. Hopp. <laughs> Miss Thomas opposed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Now we need a motion. No. Do we know? We don't. We don't. We close session. Have a motion to adjourn yeah. into executive session. What's that? As you have a motion to adjourn into executive session, that's already passed. Yeah. So no. the motion. All right. Thank so you. We're adjourned.